And we've got the very own Dave Wombat in the house. Uh, welcome, Mr. Wombat. It's really cool to have you here, man. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So I'm, we're going to recycle a couple of questions uh, from the last sessions just to get you a little note, just to get to know you a little better, uh, the man behind the mutants. So um, what was the first cube you ever grew? Well, uh, I, you know, it was, it was about 25 years ago now, uh, but the same, the same hype was out there for, uh, for B plus and golden teacher at the time that they were somehow beginner friendly. So B plus was actually the first variety I picked up. I grabbed a print from, uh, from the Hawks eye, which is now mushrooms.com. Uh, and I had, uh, I had learned how to make my own, my own agar from, uh, from the psilocybin growing manual, uh, Osin Eric's. Um, psilocybin mushroom growing guide book, which is like 1973 or something like that. Uh, but I, I, I boiled some potatoes, made my agar plates, uh, scratched the print on there, and uh, I actually hadn't done any research as to what to do next. Uh, so I got some clean germination on my first try on my first plate. I had one, one agar plate uh, that grew out completely and sprouted a little mushroom. That was my first shroom. See. That's awesome. Right, let's smoke one more bowl. So, uh, what what drew you into a uh, mushroom cult in the first place? Well, it it hadn't even occurred to me at first. Like, I, I lived down in Texas in my teenage years, and uh, and wild cubes are fairly easy to come by down there. Uh, I mean, whenever rain happens, anyway. If there's no rain, there's no mushrooms, but. But it never even occurred to me that you could grow them. I just thought they were all found outside somewhere. Uh, so we would, you know, every time there was a rain, we'd go out and, and trespass in somebody's cow field and try not to get shot. Uh, but eventually I, I moved from Texas to central Illinois, where it's, it's nothing but cornfields. And there, there's really no uh, local actives here at all. Uh, and so that's when I, and I didn't know anybody. I moved to a new state and I knew no one. So I figured uh, I, I, I had to figure something out or I wasn't going to be tripping. And so that's when I, that's when I picked up the, uh, the Osin Eric's mushroom growing guide and, uh, and got started from there. That's awesome, man. Um, uh, cultivation comes real easy to some folks. And uh, to others, the initial learning curve is pretty, pretty damn brutal. Uh, did you have a rocky start, or did it just come naturally to you? A little bit of both, really. Uh, I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of hard-headed and adventurous. Like I like to figure things out on my own. And uh, if if you've ever done any uh, experimental mushroom growing, uh, it, that doesn't work very well. Uh, most of the time, uh, but uh, but but starting with the basics from from Os and Eric's book, and then from from reading reading things online, uh, the, I'm not I don't know if the shroomery was there when I first started. I I didn't know about it anyway. Uh, like, a, like a expert, but there was there was uh, there was uh, there was, uh, there was uh, the lyceum.org and arrowhead.org had all kinds of trip reports and and people would put up their little how tos on there and that was that was where i was getting some information too but uh i i kind of i, I got like the very basics from from the book and then just kind of branched out on my own i figured i needed some kind of grain a whole grain and i chose whole grain brown rice as my starting grain uh which nowadays has a pretty bad uh reputation because of the uncle ben bags uh but the rice itself isn't at fault uh just the fact that you're shooting a syringe into a bag is is the problem and that doesn't work very well even with with sterilized grains that you've prepared yourself um but i my my initial uh my initial grows were were done cake style kind of like pf tech but I was making the cakes out of whole grain brown rice and then fruiting them on a bed of perlite, uh, just in a non-modified plastic tub. I was cracking the lid and fanning it to, to give it some air a few times a day. And, uh, and, and it seemed to work. Uh, and eventually I learned about, I learned about bulk growing because I'd seen pictures of it and, uh, and figured out how to do that from, uh, you know, preparing the substrate and then just smashing my rice into it. I did eventually get away from rice and into rye and wheat and, and better grains. 
the rice works, but it's not ideal. Uh, it's very difficult to shake. If it's hydrated properly, it's sticky, so it doesn't shake and break up very well. So if you have a, any, anything larger than like a half pint jar, it'll stall out before it colonizes. So uh, I, I did I did start off using just half pint jars and and brown rice, and then uh, and then eventually got to uh, got to a slightly more advanced method. I didn't actually participate in any kind of communication with another grower until just a few years ago, though. Uh, I'd been kind of boycotting social media because I had issues with an ex that, you know, we didn't get along, and I just blew the whole thing off and figured I didn't need to talk to anybody. Uh, but then I eventually broke down and, and got back into Facebook, and uh, Jick Fibs was actually one of the first people I talked to in the Myco community. And uh, and we hit it off and and did some trades and and that's how we got started with the whole the whole tat thing. He'd already been doing the tat thing for about maybe a year or two at that point, and then uh, and then he brought me on board. That's awesome. I love Chick. He's a he's a great human being. Yeah, he uh, he actually had had uh, he just had the regular tat, and then he had ghost and yeti at that point. The tat family tree was was a very small, like a twig at that point. Uh, and then he actually he traded me uh, a print of the source genetics in exchange for my uh, my KSSS squats, which were kind of rare at the time. I guess it was somewhat lost genetic I, I a few people had it but it wasn't in general circulation so it was kind of a rare thing so he traded his rare thing for my rare thing and i still don't think he's ever, ever actually grown it but i've done <laughs> I've, I've done quite a bit with that tap print since he sent it to me um we we try to make it a point uh when we have some of our micro heroes on to chat uh that we we normalize failure uh Everybody fails. It's part of the game. Uh, do you have any particularly memorable failures worth sharing? Uh, maybe some words of encouragement for the new folks who uh, really haven't made it over that hill yet. Well, it's it's a it's 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 all down to your technique. I mean, you you can follow the instructions. They tell you follow the tech, follow the tech, follow the tech, and for some reason it just doesn't work like it does in the pictures when you do it. You know, uh, but it, it just there's there's little tiny tweaks you do to your sterile technique, the way you move, the way you hold your tools, uh, learning to use a SAB uh, or or a flow hood even is, is, is a great device. But if you don't have the sterile technique down before you get it, it's still not going to help you. Uh, it just, it takes practice. Uh, when you first start out, you have more failures than not. And, and gradually those numbers shift in the other direction. Uh, I actually went contam free for a good long period uh before i started getting more into the the breeding and and uh isolating stuff and then once i started doing that uh, my my contam numbers have jumped up quite a bit because now i'm working from multi-spore instead of cleaning the cultures through numerous transfers before they go to grain now i'm trying to fruit the initial multi-spore culture to get the most diversity in the grow uh which comes with some additional risk so I mean, I don't always show all my contam tubs, but I have more than most uh, experienced growers probably have just because of that risk taking. But uh, it, it just, it comes with practice. That's all I can say. Uh, the more you do it, the easier it gets. You you make small adjustments and refine your technique and uh, eventually those numbers drop for you or or they go back up. Like if you're me and you take stupid risks. Yeah, same. I like to tell folks, man, it's, it's just muscle memory. After a while, you do it so many times. Um, and, and redundancy, you know, don't make one plate, make two, you know, make three, make four. <laughs> if you're crazy, make a dozen. You know? it, it really is. I agree with that. I, I, did a, I did a short video a while back for one of the groups on uh, doing some transfers, some clones and stuff in a, in a SAB. And... As I'm doing the video and editing it and adding captions to it, it just occurs to me like every few seconds how many things I'm forgetting to tell people. Like I'm like, oh, well, I was doing this too, but I wasn't even thinking about it, you know, because it's just it becomes habit after a while. Uh, so trying to explain to somebody how to work in a SAB for the first time is, is actually pretty complex. Uh, there's a lot of little nuances to it. The, uh, the, the success stories, though, 
Uh, that's what we're all here for. Uh, you never forget that feeling, man. The first time you smash a canopy and it's like, look what I did, man. Uh, what, what's your most memorable, uh, I wiped my own ass, you know, uh, what's the most memorable one to you? Honestly, I, I think the, the thing that just had like a light bulb pop up over my head was, was my very first cloning. Uh, because I didn't know about it. Uh, I, I did everything from spore. Uh, I started off with agar, the very first grow that I did, and then I didn't use it for years. Uh, once I got culture going, I did grain to grain transfers and just kept my mushrooms growing uh, that way. And uh, and then occasionally I would start from print again. But it never occurred to me that there was such a thing as cloning. And then just it just like one day I was just like something had happened. I'd lost some I'd lost some grain jars or something, but I had fruits, and I it just occurred to me that maybe I could pull a piece out of the middle of the fruit and put it on some, I actually didn't even use agar again. I would put it directly into a jar of grain and, uh, and booyah, it worked. Uh, really, I wouldn't recommend that. It's much better to put it on agar, but I got lucky that time. Uh, it, and, and, and it, I didn't even think of it as cloning at the time. I just, I, I called it, I didn't even talk to anybody, so I didn't call it anything, but in my own head, I just considered it like to be a transfer like a grain to grain transfer, but taking it from fruit. Um, so I didn't really know about how the genetics worked at that point either. I, I didn't know that it took two spores to make a fruiting culture or, or that each mushroom represented one spore combination in that mix. I just, I didn't know any of that. Uh, I was just trying to get them to grow. That's awesome, man. I've actually done tissue to grain before and uh, it is risky, but uh, it's surprisingly easy. Uh, it just kind of takes off. Well, and, and, and this was this was tissue to brown rice grain at the time too, so it's like, it had its it had its downside. But when you open up one of those jars of, of brown rice that's cooked up in the jar, uh, it makes a pretty flat surface on top, so it's almost like a plate, uh, just made out of grains. If you want to look at it that way, but uh, so yeah, they were like kind of a combination of of culture plates and grain jars so i was using them for both so uh when you first started and you were using the brown rice uh were you doing it like the bro boy method were you steaming it for hours and hours or were you legit uh pressure cooking it no i was i was legit pressure cooking it i had it worked out to where i knew on the sides of the jars how far to fill it with like i'd put a scoop like one scoop of grain in there and then i knew how far to fill it up on the on the side of the jar to get the the water content just right. I never measured the amount, so I still don't know how much it was. But then I would I would put that raw rice with water in the pressure cooker and uh, and zap them for ninety minutes, and it would cook up just right. Uh, and you know sometimes it was a little dry and sometimes it was a little wet. So you know you just make adjustments until you get it right. But uh, but yeah, I just I I I don't know about that broke boy method. Like it it sounds like it's kind of glorifying brokenness too much like like who wants to be that broke <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, uh, honestly man i have seen people murder it uh with broke boy and uh I i'd rather pressure cook mine all day every day but uh it's it's cool for uh entry level i think just like uncle ben's man well and it, uh, it can be done can. it can right. be done and, it, and it's definitely it's definitely easier with that's that's where brown rice has an advantage over like more i guess legitimate grains like like rye or wheat or oats uh yet you can't get away with steam sterilizing them because of the endospores like they will go completely nasty on you but the brown rice is is a pretty pretty simple like it's just a pretty solid little kernel of nutrition it doesn't have like a like a hull or anything Right, I'd ran it. It uh, it uh, colonizes pretty awesome. I was actually a, uh, I ran out of oats one day, and uh, to get nine jars, I had to add, you know, a whole bag of rice. So I was running half oats, half brown rice, and it actually worked out really well. Yeah, I've actually one of my one of my best one of my best uh, biological efficiency tests was was with brown rice. I was shooting for. Uh, a really high spawn ratio using the brown rice so so almost equal parts spawn and sub and then kind of a kind of a thin substrate layer too and my goal was for it to fruit 
as much as it could in one pop and and be done with and i got the most fantastic flush out of this little cake i mean it it, it produced like crazy uh but then i just went back to popcorn because it's more convenient i like it i'm actually doing my first popcorn runs right now like uh I seen you and Jick kill it constantly with popcorn, so I had to give it a try. I'm not gonna lie, right? <laughs> Jick was the one that talked me into popcorn in the first place, and my first few my first few runs with it were pretty foul. Uh, and and I don't think it's more contaminatable than any other grain, but it shows it more. Like just the way the kernels look, they look so pretty and yellow and clean, and then when they get nasty, they get visibly like disgusting fast. Uh, and so I was horrified. Uh, but, but I also was also, uh, doing 90 minutes in the PC at that point in time. And, uh, and most of, most of us are doing 120 minutes now to be on the safe side. And I've had a lot, a lot fewer problems since then. So if you're, if yeah, you're doing, I, if you're doing 120 minutes, good for you, but I don't, don't do 90. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've gone as far as uh, now, uh, just general practice, uh, two and a half to three hours, and uh, considerably less problems. Well, and I think the ninety minutes works with some with some preparation techs. Like if you have like uh, like an overnight soak and then a boil, uh, or soak and simmer or whatever, where where you ha you give the endospores a chance to germinate and get you know active, and then you kill them in the 90 minutes but sometimes just going straight in from because we don't do that with corn it's, it's just a real quick boil and straight into the pc uh so it doesn't have that additional time to to fester and and germinate so um uh speaking of jick and them guys uh internet mushroom communities right um uh, whether it's facebook or discord instagram uh, outdated message boards from the 90s. Uh, they're inundated with uh, toxic douchebags, uh, keeping assholes everywhere. Um, you guys, uh, you, you have your share of drama, but that's the internet. There's always fucking drama. But for the most part, uh, the Syndicate, Wombat Labs, uh, Yoshi's Island, uh, that you guys have this positive, welcoming, like uplifting culture. Uh, you're out here pushing things forward and uh, lifting people up along the way. Uh, this is the culture we really try to embody at the gene pool. And uh, it's one of the things I really admire about you guys. Uh, so this isn't much of a question. Uh, I just really wanted to say uh, uh, thanks, dude, uh, for all the time and effort and uh, all the knowledge, everything you contribute to this hobby. Um, did, did you ever expect your uh, little online communities to get so massive that's uh not you know i don't know like i i kind of felt like i was jumping into the ocean when i when i got on facebook and discovered the mushroom groups in the first place first off the shroomery which was around like 180,000 <laughs> members at that point in time uh it's that's it's that's pretty ridiculous uh and uh, now i've got the wombat labs group is is been around for it's only been open for a few months, but we're up to 2,000 members, and I already feel like it's it's huge, you know. Uh, but I, you know, I, as far as like the the drama and the gatekeeping and stuff goes, like I, I think a lot of the a lot of the experienced growers uh, are coming from a background of uh, a career as a as a drug dealer, basically. Uh, so so there's like a different mindset there. Like you kind of like you're. You're like you like to show off your tubs and you want people to grow but you don't want them to grow quite as well as you do because now they're competition like you're you're looking at them as like they're you know breaking into your market or whatever uh and i'm coming more from like a i've most of my career i've been in in food service i've done restaurant management and worked as a chef uh and so like i i look at it almost in the same way like it's not quite the customer's always right but but i see everyone as a guest like everybody's a guest, uh, they're coming to your establishment, whether it's your restaurant or your mushroom group, and and they're there to be entertained. And uh, it, it's so you want to have fun with it. You want it to be oh hello, you. Uh, 
but it's 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 I, I I look at it as a as a as a customer service kind of thing. Like like you just you want it to be positive. You want to if somebody's having a bad experience, you want to try and turn it around and find the good in it. You know, and and uh, and and salvage that. You know, and and I've done a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of mentoring, trying to get uh, trying to get new growers to to get their feet under them. You know, and and then like that's probably the greatest feeling when you see somebody that was coming from struggling at nothing to now they're now they're showing off full canopy tubs like and and, and wowing people with it and and i i take a lot of pride in in knowing that i've helped some people get to that point absolutely it's it's almost like a hobby inside a hobby that is one of the greatest feelings when a, a friend that you've been helping and encouraging through, a, you know, through contamination, like, you got it, bro. Try one more time, you know, and then they start killing it. It's it's one of the greatest feelings, man. And sometimes it's hard getting to that point. I've, I've had to talk some people through some, like, they were getting ready to throw away all their stuff and like, <laughs> like don't give up, you know, like it's you'll get there like it 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 really is a numbers game it just takes repetition and the more you do it you know that the the more it falls into place so guys like uh uh you and tim pig and jick and pasty and yoshi uh you guys have all created amazing isolations and hybrids that uh they're admired by folks all over the world like uh even just in the gene pool we've got guys growing uh, syndicate stuff in Japan, uh, Germany, uh, Singapore, like we have people all over the world growing your shit, man. Uh, does it give you an awesome sense of immortality? Like I imagine it does. To a certain extent. Yes. Like I, I, it makes me proud to know that, that I've made something that is appreciated by so many people. Uh, and there's there's you know there's a couple different schools of thought on that as well like uh you know jick has had his his battles with uh what he called pirates which was people that were underselling his genetics and this is when they were very new you know he had just sold them and people were set, like growing them and then turning around and selling them for half the price and uh and and not always like with the same quality of uh of product you know and 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 it's just I I, I kind of looked at it a different way. Like I've always been kind of comfortable with like if if you bought it and you grew it, then it's yours. Uh, as long as you're keeping the name on it that I gave it in the first place, then it's just it's just moving it further. Like I can't I can't take enough orders in a day to to get the spores to everybody that wants them. It's just not possible. Uh, so like uh, like other people selling my genetics helps me in that sense because like i i feel bad when i get into my message box and somebody's like hi you know i i wanted to i wanted to buy these genetics from you and i look at the date on it and it's like six months and and i'm like sorry i didn't see your message for six months you know like i i feel you know you could have had like a couple of tubs by now <laughs> you know it's but uh, but yeah, like I, I I think uh Jack Frost is probably a really good example of uh of one that really really blew up, uh, and it's just because it was so striking the the color the color combination on it was pretty pretty fantastic, uh, and I as soon as as soon as I saw that uh there were like actual spore websites carrying it that you know I don't know who owns them somebody bought it you know and and grew it and and got it to them. But uh, I think that's pretty cool to see uh, to see my product, and sometimes they even mention my name on there, you know, and that's kind of nice too. That is pretty rad. Uh, that's uh, personal goals, man. I'd, I'd love to get there someday. So I'm, I, I want to touch on your Gandalf a little bit. Uh, it was a whole damn saga, man. Uh, for anyone turning in that uh, may have missed it, uh, you want to you want to share the Gandalf story? Absolutely. Okay. So Gandalf, like I I didn't actually work on Gandalf. I was I was super focused on my KSSS and Tat cross at the time. I was determined to get albino squash out of this combination, and it took me a couple of years. But while I was fighting with that, uh, J 
Jick had started the, the TAM project, uh, which is what produced Gandalf, Pearly Gates, and, and now a few other things have come from it since then. But, uh, but he, got, he got started on the one isolation, which it was only producing one, maybe two super massive gnarly fruits in a tub. Like, I mean, you're talking like the subsurface is empty except for this one fruit in the corner. Uh, and, but it was a gnarly fruit. And so that, and that's, that's where Gandalf started. Like he passed that on over to, uh, uh, Michael Mama Angela and, and, uh, her husband, and they took it over and were doing the, the final, like, I think maybe three generations of stabilization on it before release. And then something went wrong. Uh, they had had some agreement with that with that between them and Jick where where they were going to uh, produce a whole bunch of swabs to be ready for the release, and then somehow they would all the parties would be compensated by it, and then somehow right when it got to release time, there was some kind of falling out where I don't know whose fault it was, maybe both, probably both. There's usually something on both sides, but for whatever reason, uh, it turned into a bunch of name calling and 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 the the project fell through like so instead of instead of releasing it since they couldn't come to an agreement on how to compensate everybody for it they just decided to release it as a as a free gift in the community uh so that way because everybody had been watching this thing develop for you know over a year and uh and were dying for it uh so so they didn't want to be greedy and say like you know but i guess they couldn't figure out how to i mean there was i i don't know i don't know it was bad they 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 still aren't friends, so uh, it turned. But it turned into something something pretty cool anyway, because like now now it's it's something to uh, to share. And uh, I still I still every time I have a handful of swabs available for it, I let people know when they're ordering. Hey, do you have Gandalf yet? I'll throw one to you, you know, and uh, spread it around because it is a really cool variety to grow. Uh, it does grow more than one fruit now. Uh, sometimes I get like. A whole tub of little fruits from it sometimes just a few giants uh but they're phenomenal looking i mean they, they've got the, the the gray wizard beard is what uh, what jit called it the big lumpy stipe underneath the underneath the cap with all the all the blue veining through it uh so it's so yeah so it's like it's kind of like like enigma where uh if you're uh if you know somebody that's got it they'll share it with you and uh and that's how it gets out there now It's pretty awesome, dude. Um, so now I, I got to get some Jack Frost lore from you. Uh, Jack Frost is the bee's knees, man. I love running Jack. Uh, it's gorgeous, dude. Uh, it's probably one of the prettiest fruits I've ever seen. Um, when you uh, it first started uh, your, your Jack Frost project, uh, did did you think it would be this successful? No, no, it was actually like, oh God, it was like the, I can't remember if I started Jack Frost first or the KSAT project. I think Jake, Jack Frost came first, uh, but it was, it was called tape when I first started it for, for tat and ape. Uh, and the ape that I had for that side of the cross was just phenomenal ape like grew big monster fruits with very blue gills and that's where the jack frost gets its blue gills from uh and then the other side of the cross was my wombat tat which is very productive uh a fairly fast growing albino uh traditional fruit shape but but a tub filler and uh and so my hope was that i would come up with something that had some of the ape potency but was more cooperative because the ape is definitely not a cooperative variety. Like it, sometimes it doesn't want a fruit for you at all. And actually since the Jack Frost cross, I haven't been able to get those apes going again. Uh, I'm still fighting with them uh, a few years later, still trying to get them to, to give me a fruit again. Um, but it, it, Jack Frost was a magical cross. It was the first, it was the first time that it occurred to me to swab both parent fruits with a single swab and then put it to agar. Uh, when I did the KSAT cross, I did it a couple of ways. I started a few plates, some by cross streaking, where you would streak the plate with the swabs and then take culture that grew from the intersections of the of the cross. And then uh, and then there was a couple of plates where I started just by putting two swab heads 
into the agar touching each other like right in the middle so that they were you know couldn't avoid each other uh but with the jack frost one it occurred to me that if i was to swab both fruits with the same swab then i would have a more even mix of spores and so when they germinated they'd be more likely to meet each other and not their own variety because if the obviously if the spores of one variety germinate before the other one then they'll self mate and you won't get a cross out of them or you can but it's a lot less likely but the the magical thing with with jack frost though was that it it just produced one single phenotype from the very first tub and i don't know if that was just because of the the ape's low spore count or what what the what the odds were of that happening but like with the ksat cross it grew a huge variety of things like a bunch of stuff in the same tub like albino fruits colored fruits like big ones fat ones skinny ones like just a whole variety of things growing in the same tub but the jack frost one just grew one it just grew one they all looked exactly the same and it and it grew like that like i i still grew it for a good four or five generations before i released it just to make sure that it it wasn't a fluke but it, it grew consistently the same from the very start like it was meant to be and then, of course, the Jack Frost name came as soon as the first the first tub of it turned blue. Like the the name occurred to me because tape is a shitty name. Uh, it's, it's a functional it's a functional name, but but it really just doesn't have a whole lot of appeal. Yeah, your Normac does that too. If you let it over ripen, it turns a gorgeous blue. That's another neat one, and that was a that was a a weird one that just kind of came by surprise. Uh, it was supposed to just be regular Normac when I got it, which is a, a reverted Melmac. It grows uh, large, regular cubes, but but large fruits, uh, spore droppers. You know, they make a mess. And uh, and when I grew it, it just it grew albinos from the very fucking start, and that was it. Like I was just like, okay, well, then they're albino Normacs, but they're not they're not normal fruitish either. They're they're different. They're they're slower and they're weird and they're pretty cool and i can't take any credit for it it just happened like i didn't do it they just grew that way that's awesome i've ran them twice and uh, one tub was spaghetti and uh the other <laughs> one that's a monster uh first first time i broke uh, the hundred club was was with the normac yeah they they do some they do some neat stuff i had they uh there's a thing that jack frost has been doing lately where parts of the parts of the cap are translucent and uh, you can actually see the bluing of the gills through the top of the cap, and it looks like a blue ring on the cap. Uh, and some people have that have that version, and some people don't. And my last tub that I grew didn't do it, but the one before did. But the Normac does that a lot too. It'll, it'll have like semi-translucent caps on some of the fruits, and they just look like they're like made out of porcelain or something. It's just really neat. Um, a, a good friend of mine. Uh, he's a mycomancer. He resurrects mushrooms from the dead. Uh, I've seen this guy clone a dried mushroom. Uh, so he's the mycomancer. His name's Ebola. Well, uh, anyways, one day he called you the, the, the fucking radioactive man. Because uh, we, we kind of joke about you a lot around here. Uh, we got a few theories about you and your mutations. Uh, everything from living on ancient burial ground uh, to ley lines, uh, some kind of top secret substrate. Now, I'm not asking you to give away any secrets or anything, but uh, come on, man. Uh, how do you consistently get such wild phenotypic expressions? There might be things that I don't really know about, uh, like the burial ground thing, or or possible <laughs> like like there might be a like a vein of uranium running underneath the house that I don't know about, but. Uh, I think it's mostly numbers. Uh, I I grow a lot of things at once, and every grow that I do, if it's not a clone of something to try and isolate it, it's it's a multi-spore plate. I very rarely make any agar transfers. Uh, if my initial spore plate is has got contamination on it, I'll cut out the parts that don't and and put them to grain and take my chances with it, uh, because I want I want to express the most possible variety. And uh, and then it's from there. It's just a matter of like looking really close at the fruits and seeing like little tiny differences. Uh, and some of those little tiny differences 
will be small in the mixed tub, but when you isolate that with a clone in its own tub so it's not competing with other genetics, then it can express more freely. And and it's also like a like a cascade effect. Like once once you have something weird happen, like uh, we'll take my El Choco, for example. Uh, I grew B+, very first mushroom I ever grew, grew it for 20 years. Uh, a good 10 or 12 years of that were grain to grain without ever going back to spore. So it, it's pretty much been the same B plus for 20 years. Uh, and then, and then one day it produced a couple of dark, hairy fruits, just a couple of them. Uh, but they were noticeably darker and definitely hairy. Uh, once I, once I separated those out and, and started the El Chaco project, they've just gotten weirder and weirder. Like they're each, Every time your 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 mushroom, like say you've got your mushroom culture or whatever, it needs to make spores, right? So it, it splits its genetics in half, and each spore contains half of what you need for a fruiting culture. But but they're all just a little bit different. Like there's there's different combinations and different you know different genes in each one, and so once you get something that's weird, like like a mutant like that, and then you get its genetics and it starts splitting into spores. Well, those spores are naturally just weirder than the spores you started with, because they're they're coming from that that weird culture to begin with, and uh, and Jack the 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 El Chaco has gone from being just a a brown a browner B plus to now it's something like really really weird like it's super solid and short, uh, very thick, uh, it's definitely strong, it's not uh, it's not B plus anymore. That's for sure. Uh, you can still get B plus from it. I've seen people get revert grows from it, where where they just look like normal cubes. It's possible, uh, and that is that's always possible with any isolation. Uh, you see more of that with uh, with contaminated grows, like uh, like a bacterial contamination, uh, kind of triggers like an emergency fruiting, where where the mushrooms just like we need to get some fruits up there and get some spores out of this tub so we can get the fuck out of here. Uh, and, and the fastest way to do that is with your traditional outside cube phenotype as the fastest growing, uh, most effective spore producer. Uh, so, so if you do like, you know, you, you're trying to grow Melmac or whatever, and you've got a, a jar that looks like it might be a little contaminated, got some of that yellow pea in the bottom of it and all that, there's a good chance that it's not going to perform. Like it still might fruit. People will tell you, oh, it's bacteria, a little still fruit. It will still fruit, but it might not fruit the way you want it to. Uh, and then the genetics that come from that reverted grow will, you don't know what they're going to do. They, you could you could pull the, the original source genetics back out of them, or it could continue down that path towards normalcy. Uh, but it's just kind of unknown. But I, I, it, I, I would say it's, it's mostly numbers. I, I run a lot of, a lot of spores straight to grain and uh and uh, i have a lot of kind of shitty looking grows because of it <laughs> but those shitty grows produce produce good uh good genetics they just don't they don't usually give you a, a full canopy when you have a mixed multi-spore grow it's it's spotty it doesn't all flush at the same time uh and you just have to accept that uh somebody asked me the other day like do I ever try for the full canopy thing? And I, and I really don't like, sometimes it just happens and I got lucky, you know, but, uh, but, uh, when you're working with multi-spore genetics, it's not, uh, that's usually not the way the usual way to do it is to do the, the multiple, uh, transfers to refine your culture down to a, a more limited range of genetics. So, uh, give us an idea of your process here. Uh, so you ran your multi-spore. Uh, you have a sweet looking monster in there. Uh, what What's your process now? W what do you do? You're, you're trying to isolate this awesome new uh, phenotypic expression. Uh, where do we go from here? Well, uh, there's clones and spores. Like I take clones and spores, if there is spores, if there aren't spores, then I just take clones sometimes. I've got a few that are really stingy with the spores. Uh, but but clones and spores. And so like you, you take the clone, you take the spores, you put them both on agar, uh, send them both to grain. And, and then it's kind of like a comparison. Like you've got like the, the multi-spore one has a more of a chance of doing something different because you can get a different combination of genetics in there. Uh, and then the, the, the clone tub is more like, more like a, like a test step, like to uh, kind of check to see if, if what you're working with was 
actually genetic or if it was an environmental uh, caused mutation. Like if it just grew that way because of the environment, you know, contamination or some right. other issue. Um, and, and, and st with some varieties, like your, your spawn ratio, your, your spawn ratio affects things. Uh, you know, some things like, like PE do better with a casing layer and some don't, you know, so there's, there's environmental factors there that can affect the way things come out. So the clone, the clone grow is to check for, for that. And it's also a backup if the uh, if the spore grow didn't do what you wanted it to do, then you've got the clone grow to take spores from again, and it's kind of like you have another shot at it. Uh, but after after the initial cloning from a, from a tub, if the if the spore grow goes well, then I'll just continue to take spores from there and try to uh, stabilize the traits by taking spores from the fruits that have the most traits that I'm looking for. Uh, and the idea there is you just you want it to you want to repeat that that process from spore until those traits are dominant and giving you that throughout the tub like obviously if you take a clone the whole tub's going to look pretty much the same because it's a clone uh but it's i guess you could sell clones to people people are doing culture sales now but uh but as far as selling swabs go you want to have some confidence that the swabs are going to produce in a way that that you expect them to and so the best way to do that is just by repetition and the standard's always been uh five like five generations is like pretty much the standard that a lot of us go by uh after after five generations from spore we're pretty confident that it's going to be growing the same way uh and that that takes a while like like it used to, it used to take me a year to a year and a half to go through five generations but i've tweaked my my process to speed it up and uh, I've gotten it down to about half that time now, and this is by using very small tubs with a with a high spawn ratio, uh, where they're al almost one to one spawn and substrate. Uh, so they they colonize and fruit super fast. I've usually got pins within a week, and uh, then there's a lot of fay. I use an open hole system in my tub, so there's a lot of airflow, and uh, and it's all just to encourage fast fruiting. So the, the sooner I can get those fruits, the sooner I can get that next generation started, and. Uh, and that's 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 probably another another advantage that I have in the in the volume of work that I produce is the just the system that I've developed is is fast. Like so, I I'm I'm very productive. You're a busy guy. Kind of hard to get a hold of. <laughs> yeah, I you know I I I I'll make a post saying that I've got stuff for sale, and then I won't check my messages for like a week. <laughs> so, are, are, it's, are there it's, any uh it's bad <laughs> yeah i was joking uh about i need a wombat signal so uh, i can just get a hold of you <laughs> well nikki michael nikki michael will tell you like all you got to do is message me with the word boobs and i'm more likely to answer it <laughs> if it's, it's anything else all right, I'll remember that. But but I, so, I figured that out now. I can see his name next to it, so I won't open it. <laughs> so are, are there any? I do, uh... I do try. I do try to be uh, uh, accessible uh, because I do. I do get a lot of messages every day, not just people wanting to buy stuff, but also uh, mentorship questions. And sometimes those get lost, and I feel bad when I when I finally get into my messages and somebody's got. A tub in there and they're like hey are these ready to pick should i pick them and i'm like yeah those are great and they're like well that was a month ago so i already picked them but thanks and i'm like oh man sorry i just <laughs> <laughs> that, that's uh one thing i really love about you guys though uh is how accessible are you are and uh uh how active you are um you're not necessarily all day just like oh look what i did showing off you know your grows uh you, you answer questions and you help folks out and uh, yeah when i found you guys i was like man these guys are the coolest motherfuckers uh you really put in the work and i really admire that man well and i i do that partially because i feel like i would have benefited from it at at an earlier point in my growing if i hadn't been a hermit uh I mean, I grew for almost 20 years without talking to anybody about it. I mean, there was a couple of local friends that I that I showed the ropes to and taught how to how to grow, but but for the most part, uh, I just wasn't in contact with anybody, and uh, and so being able to like turn around and like help people, like when I see people like 
going through the same struggles that I went through when I first started. Like I've already got the answers for them, you know, so I can get them, you know, on a good track faster than if they, you know, are poking around in the dark like I was. And I got lucky. I mean, I, I was, I was fairly successful from the start. Like I, I, I had my own made up methods and they just happened to work, but they could have worked better. Uh, I, I think one of the biggest things that's advanced in the last like couple decades is, is fruiting, fruiting chambers have gotten a lot better. Uh, like your basic monotub is way better than like a long time ago. Like people were using like fish aquariums and, and, you know, they're, they're made out of glass and they're really heavy and they're hard to clean out. And, and, uh, and I guess, I guess plastic totes are a lot more accessible now that there's Walmarts everywhere too, but, but, but just like the basic monotub is a great thing. Like compared to the, the original tub that I was using was just a basic unmodified tub. And you had to, you had to open and close it multiple times a day to get your airflow. And, uh, when I, when I, finally saw a monotub and was like, Hey, like micropore tape, like this is pretty cool. <laughs> but then I decided I hated micropore tape too, because I started doing all these little tubs and, uh, changing them out every couple of weeks. I, I it was a lot of freaking tape. Like I was going, <laughs> I was going nuts. I, I mean, I run like 60 to 80 of these little six quart tubs at a time, all with something different in them. And, uh, and so it, it's just a lot of tape. So I, I, I came up with this this system of, of drilled holes where I'm just making a line of, of quarter inch holes every few inches around the kind of like around the midline of the tub and uh, like just above where the sub level would be. And uh, and that's my face system is just open holes and uh, it works. It's not good so if you have not. nets, if you have fungus nets, uh, they'll be they'll be in and out of all your tubs. So be prepared that's for right. that. That's my current battle right now. I'm <laughs> actually at a complete standstill for uh, about two more weeks because it was bad. Well, you know they'll find their way. Even if you have like tubs with micropore tape, they can find their way in. They're they're teeny tiny. I think they can shit their eggs right through the micropore tape. Uh, they're 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 evil. But I I had a I've had a couple of low level like problems with them but they they really like contaminated grows like they're very much attracted to sour grains uh and that's 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 what got them started was i had a, a couple of funky tubs and they definitely preferred those but once they're once they're set up in those tubs then they start going over to the other ones and they bring the contamination with them and uh and they can get they can really get out of hand pretty quick uh i did i did get rid of them um just by throwing my tubs out after the first flush. Like if you dump your tubs after the first flush, they don't have enough time for their reproductive cycle to, uh, to get to that next step basically. So it kind of interrupts them. And so like after, after dumping all my tubs after the first flush, their numbers diminished quickly and, and then they were gone. You have to, I mean, you're, you're accepting some loss there on your productivity for sure, but it's still better than having a bunch of freaking gnats in your house. It drives me crazy. Yeah, it's awful. Every summer, man, you know, like clockwork. I, I need to start just planning for it. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, like, dumping after the first flush is, is a good step towards getting rid of I've heard people vacuuming them out of the tubs. Uh, there's some stuff. Uh, it's a it's a bacterial thing. I uh, I forget what it's called. But I uh, think Nikki Michael was trying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's for you know yeah. for plants for plants, uh, but that would be a, a substrate additive that you could put in there, and it, it it basically kills off the larva so they can't develop into adults. Uh, and and Nikki Micah was trying that out. I, I think he was having some success with it. I never ended up trying it because uh, my gnats went away. Right, I've been dosing my house plants with them. Unfortunately, I live in a jungle, so. Uh... <laughs> I kind of just always am dealing with that. There's always going to be more. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, yeah, there's, I, I tried, uh, I tried a uh, Venus fly trap. Uh, they don't, they don't go for those. Uh, and fungus gnats are weird gnats. Like they can fly, but they usually walk. Like they're really strange. Uh, but yeah, the Venus fly trap didn't, uh, didn't, didn't get any of them. <laughs> so that is, that is not an option. So um, are, are there any uh, varieties that uh, you haven't dabbled in 
uh, that you'd like to? Uh, anything cool you got planned in the works? Um, I've got well, I've got a couple coming up that are that I'm excited for. I've got uh, I've got uh, uh, Michael Clay's uh, PF Albino in a couple of tubs now, uh, and I've been sitting on that for a while, uh, waiting to get it into rotation. But that's an exciting one because that's uh, the PF Albino is is one half of the original Ape uh, was was a cross of PE and and PF Albino. Uh, and it's, it's pretty much been a lost variety, uh, for, I don't know, probably a decade or so before Michael Clay resurrected it and, uh, and got it back into production. So I am excited about that one. And it's, it's, when you, when you think of, of Ape and you know, oh, it's, it's a PE cross. So you, you expect the PE had a lot to do with it, but the PF albino is a really weird albino. It's not just a regular white fruit. Like it's got its own kind of magic characteristics to it. Uh, so I am excited about that one. I also, I've never, I've never run any tidal wave. Uh, and I don't know why. I think I've got some in my pile of swabs I haven't started yet. And I just haven't started it yet. But uh, I've been wanting to. I just, I need to find them. Uh, Workman, uh, Sporeworks has some tidal wave. And uh, it's fantastic, man. Uh, all I did was multi-spore. But, uh. The, the tubs I ran were outstanding for, for a brown cube. It's, it's pretty awesome. Well, yeah, and it's, it's, it's got a lot of, there's a lot of tidal waves out there. Like, I, I, I don't know how to, how to say it. Like, the, the website, the, the Magic Myco website describes some of his varieties as being very multi. Like, they have a lot of different manifestations they can take and and I, I that's definitely true with the tidal waves because i you see different people post and grows and none of them look alike like they're all like they're they're all neat but they're not all the same and so i i'm, I'm just curious as to what what's it going to give me you know like i just i want to know that's the fun part and that's and, and i've got i've got a i got a, a a jar i just put into a tub right now that is a question mark it was a question mark agar plate because i somehow didn't label it so i don't know what it was but the culture looked great and i've got it in a tub and i'm more excited for that tub than any other tub. it could be it could be some regular boring variety for all i know but I, i'm just i'm just dying to see it produce something because i don't know what it is and yeah, that's that's that's, that's kind of one fun. of the magic things about the crosses too is that they're unpredictable like like you could you could say like i'm hoping to get you know, this quality from one variety and this quality from another variety, but you don't know what it's going to do. Like they, when, when two genetics that have grown separately get mixed together, the, the combinations are endless. Uh, the case at was a, a great example of that because I, I, I wanted albino KSSS squats. Like, obviously that's like, sounds like a great idea. Right. Uh, but it produced just randomness for, for two years. It gave me a different grows every time i grew it it grew something completely different it wasn't albino it was golden capped and, and dropped spores some of the time didn't drop spores some of the times but it wasn't squatty it was just different it just like really weird looking fruits and uh and then finally it it ended up uh i just i just got frustrated and uh and went back to the very first print that i made from the first generation and started over and i got albino squats on the first try from that print and, and then I was mad that I just spent the last two years chasing ghosts. But, but then like after I've had the squats now, I was, I was doing a grow that was supposed to be in the squats and it gave me another couple of tubs of complete randomness. Like I've got another 10 different projects going from it now, like all different shapes and sizes and just weird looking fruits. And, uh, like, like Jick, Jick, Jick's got the tat thing. Like Jick's pretty much dedicated to growing just tat genetics. Uh, he, he says he doesn't feel the need to grow any other kind. Uh, and, and he doesn't because there really is unlimited variety in the tat genetics. I need to do another, another source grow for those too. Uh, because every time I start from a, a grow from that original print, I get like five or six different projects out of the same tub. And, and I've still got, I, I, the reason I haven't is because I'm still working on stabilizing the last projects that I got out of it. Uh, but, but it really is just, I mean, endless variety from just one, one single genetic. Uh, there's, there's no end to the possibilities that you can do with it. 
And now the uh, uh, Mexican red spore is another one that I've been doing really well with lately. I've got this this wild Mexican red spore. It was sent to me. Uh, it came. It was found in Mexico, and then sent to me uh, from Chile, and just a little tiny red print. And it's just like every time I've grown it, it's done something different. And I've gotten uh, like my chupacabra project out of it, uh, which is a big purple spore. Uh, kind of the mushroom caps kind of bowl up, and sometimes they fill with water. Like they draw water up out of the sub and fill up like a bowl of water on top. Uh, and I just got some albinos out of it that have gills that look like like moral mushrooms. Like they're all kind of amorphous, like grid work grills that branch and fork and connect. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited to see the next round of those come up. But that's another one where it's just, just one variety produces endless, endless variation. Oh yeah, I've been running Jick's uh, Ghost for about a year and a half now, and uh, I've been just uh, swabbing the ghostiest looking ones of every tub. And uh, when I lay the pictures down over the, the course of when I started to now, uh, it, it's a totally different fruit now. And uh, I really enjoy this game. <laughs> it is a great game. Well, and that's, that's, I, I've tried to, I've tried to explain, I've talked to a couple of people that are just like, I don't care about that. I just want to grow mushrooms. And I'm like, well, then just get, you know, some syringes online or something like <laughs> there's, there's, there's different, you know, and not everybody's in the hobby for the same reason. Some people just want the medicine. Some people just want the product or whatever, you know, uh, but I, I feel like if you actually experienced like this evolution like if you if you actually like grow enough times in a row to see like because it's not like plants like the the reproductive cycle with the mushrooms is so much shorter that you can see actual changes like generational changes in real time like in in a much shorter time like you don't have to wait a year to see what the next crop's going to look like you know you can you can get like several crops throughout the year and and see it evolve like quickly through that But that is that is probably like like my favorite part of the hobby. I mean, uh, and and I was doing it even with like the regular varieties that I grew in the in the early days. I, I was doing it kind of without thinking about it, like because you you grow a bunch of regular cubes, and, uh, and they all pretty much look the same. But but you you select the best fruits to start your next generation just just on instinct. Like you're like, I like this big one here. I'm going to take spores from this one, you know? And uh, and just even without thinking about it, you kind of naturally progress towards better through selection. Yeah, I, I think that's my favorite part too. Uh, the entire process, man, that's my zen. Uh, it, it's my time. And, uh, but... Uh, that You know, when, when people... A lot of people are, are hesitant to start agar. They're like, not not that agar stuff. It's it's weird. It's sciency. It's hard. Uh, it contaminates easily. Well, well, yeah, that's that's the whole point. You know, it's it's nutritious. Uh, but once you start doing it, like I feel like uh, more people get addicted to that part of the hobby than any other part. Like it, it's daunting at first because it's you know it's intimidating. It's a new process if you've never done it. But once you start getting those ropey plates going, like, you're hooked. Like, you almost don't even want to send them to grain anymore. You just want to take pictures of them. <laughs> you want to shellac it and save it forever. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, like, pour, some, pour some, uh, some resin or epoxy resin into it. Hey, that's an idea. I, yeah, I thought about that. But then, like, I don't know how the moisture would do trapped behind it. Like, right. it might get weird. So I'm, I I got one last question for you, man, and uh, I'm going to throw you to the wolves because uh, there's a lot of people in here waiting to talk to you, dude. Uh, th this uh, whole mushroom cultivation, man, the bubble's just getting bigger and bigger. And uh, some of these fringe myco groups, uh, thousands of people in them, you know, uh, our whole hobby is, is getting huge. And at the same time, uh, it's getting more commercialized by the day. Like folks are selling inflatable monotubs. You can buy a sab on Amazon for a hundred bucks. Like, um, 
What oh, do you the one, think? The one on uh, the one on Etsy. It's like the the Hurricane HEPA filter flow box thing. It's like a <laughs> it's like a four hundred dollar sab with a with a blower attached to it. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is, but don't buy it. Oh. No, of course not. Um, <laughs> it looks cool, but don't, <laughs> it's not going to work. But what do you envision uh, like the future of home cultivation is going to be like? I you know that's. The legalization was starting with decriminalization, but it's working towards legalization now. Uh, if you look at how that's worked with cannabis, uh, it, it's weird, you know? Like, it, it, you go to, like, it went from being something that people kept a secret, you know, hidden in their closet, to, like, now it's, like, it's it's totally cool to grow weed, you know? And, uh, and, I, and I figure it should be like that with mushrooms, too, like... It's it's just I I don't know how the commercialization part's going to work. Like I see I see weird ads on Facebook, like sponsored ads for mycology products. Now, uh, that's that's a big step. Amazon, you know, carries tons of stuff. You know, it's 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 definitely like it's definitely a business. But I, I don't know how that's going to work with the with the legalization. Like I I know kits are going to become af affordable and 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 available. Uh, there's already like some crappy ones out there, but but like ones that are like set up ready to grow, basically. Uh, like functional kits will probably be uh, like kind of like an entry level thing. Uh, and then like I, I think I think like your your standard like outdoor type cubes are gonna be like more available in like the the shops. Like like. I've heard that some some weed dispensaries are are actually having mushroom spores now too, uh, so that's that's a thing. Like, and I, but I but I feel like the average person that's just getting into the hobby isn't ready for a swab of of hat black caps that even expert growers have a hard time getting started. You know, so so I think it's it's probably going to start like becoming more popular just to have regular mushrooms as far as like an entry level thing. Uh, and then, and then people are gonna keep growing the good stuff at home. Uh, they're they're already like, they already said in uh, in Oregon, they've already said that they don't want to use anything other than cubensis for the uh, the administered therapies. They want to use just cubensis because they're scared of of wood lovers paralysis or whatever else that they've heard of, uh, or or it just being too strong, and. Uh, and and I think that's kind of limiting because it's it's just it's more that they just don't understand. Like there's there's nothing wrong with taking a, a pan cyan or or whatever you know instead of a cube as long as you know how to dose with it. Uh, and I guess we're going to understand more about that too as testing becomes more available with legality, uh, because we can actually like start to figure out like what these compounds do. Like it's just it's been impossible to get any legitimate research done on them uh but i i i feel like i feel like it's it's, it's probably going to follow along the the same lines as as weed it just might take a little bit longer uh because they were you know they were fighting for weed for like my entire life they've been fighting for legalization and uh, and i'm i'm about to turn 50 and uh i didn't even know that i was going to live to see legalization for weed and it's kind of neat you know my state my state's had it legal for a couple of years now and it's uh it's phenomenally expensive uh, to buy it at the shops, and I still won't. But but it's cool that it's there. Like I, I just I feel like the, that's probably going to be an issue with uh, with mushroom dispensaries as well. Is like they'll be there, but they'll be very expensive, and it's just for anybody that really is interested in it. It's so much more affordable to grow it, even compared to buying it on the street. Like I I I don't know what people pay for mushrooms on the street. I really don't because I've grown my own for most of my life but i know it's a lot cheaper to grow them than it is to buy them like uh what uh like a dollar worth of uh a dollar worth of dry popcorn produces i, I don't know like an ounce of mushrooms maybe like I, I i can't i can't do the math in my head that quick but it, it's definitely cheap to grow them so like but but a lot of people won't like just like a lot of people don't have time to grow weed that's easier for them to go down to the dispensary and and overpay for a, a couple grams of something special for a special occasion you know so so i don't know i i feel like i feel like the the home cultivation is still going to be where it's at 
uh, as far as the hobby goes. Yeah, I can't wait. Uh, especially, you know, the new cool stuff comes out, you know, every day. Like Yoshi's over there doing some ninja shit with uh, Natalensis. Yes. Um, and, you know, I'm excited to see the future, man. And uh, like you said, uh, it evolves quick. Uh, three generations of mushrooms in, you know, four months, five, six months, maybe. But uh, it, it just keeps getting cooler and cooler. That's 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 why I've always wanted to to be. I mean, I, I'm a salesman too. You know, I do I do sell spores, and uh, and uh, you know, coming up with with cool names for them is is marketing. You know, in a sense. But but I'm I'm a teacher before that. Like my main thing is I want people to learn how to grow and become self sufficient with it. And and then if they want, you know spores of something that i'm working with like to 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 grow then i'm more than happy to help out but but first and foremost I, i'm all about promoting the the learning and uh and I, I you know that's that's one of the whole like like the whole lc question like people are like well should lc be for sale and i'm like well you know it's a means to an end you know it's it's for for somebody that doesn't want to get into the whole agar game uh lc is a, a quick and easy way to get yourself a tub of fruits but but then are you dependent on getting more lc or are you going to learn how to make your own and and become self-sufficient in that sense in which case you're going to have to learn the agar game and and all that so i mean I, I, same with kits like you don't want to be dependent on having to buy refills for a kit uh when you can just do it yourself with with stuff that you buy at the local you know grocery store or hardware store yeah, my, my friend Inertia, I can't remember what the, the numbers were, but uh, he crunched the numbers once, and I think it was like 60-something cents an ounce using oats. Like uh, a, a full tub growing from spore, uh, you know, the cost there. I mean, you're not taking into account, you know, the pressure cooker, the tub, all that, but uh, grain and core. Uh, right, I was going to say like that. 60 cents an ounce. The core is is more expensive than the grain these days. Absolutely, especially if you get the good stuff. Well, you got to get the good stuff. Now, dude, uh, I, I really don't want to take up all your time. Uh, there's a lot of folks out here just uh, waiting to chat with you. But uh, I would like to thank you again, Mr. Wombat. It's been an absolute privilege to chat with you. Uh, thank you for everything you do in this uh, Myco community. Uh, uh, you're the shit, dude. Well, I'm happy to. I'm happy to participate. The hardest part was figuring out Discord because it's you know it's like a uh, it's like a younger person's app. Like I think like Facebook is is made for old people like me that uh, that graduated from MySpace and uh, and and we understand the the ins and outs of it. And then I jump into Discord and I'm just like boggled. Like what is what? Like there's a lot of stuff. But I, I think I'll get the hang of it, you know, if I if I play around with it some. I just haven't spent any time in it. Oh, you're more than welcome anytime, man. I will definitely be here. And I am open to any questions. If anybody else has any questions that they want to ask, like, shoot, I'm, I'm ready. Like, ask away. All right, the floor is yours, guys. Uh, thanks for coming again. Thank you, Dave. You're the man. I might as well just break the ice. I did have a question. So, in regards to commercialization and legalization of psilocybin, I saw a documentary that Vice had done, and one of the key points they brought up was there's a company that's actively trying to patent the chemical structure of psilocybin. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't know if that's possible. Like, I, I, I mean, I don't doubt that somebody would try to do it because people suck and they they want to capitalize on things and make sure other people can't but it, it'd be real hard to like i mean like like with uh with with uh with cannabis strains like people are are trying to patent those as well and and it's almost like you're you're you can patent the brand name but you have to have you have to meet certain uh you have to meet certain criteria to demonstrate that like if it's the same with like if you have like a, a any kind of crop 
like a, a corn crop, if you want to patent your own particular strain of corn, you have to be able to demonstrate how it's different from everybody else's corn uh, and, and why and whatnot. So I don't, think, I don't think it's possible for somebody to actually nail down just the molecule itself, uh, but there might end up being some, some patenting of, or trademarking at least, of, of names once, uh, once things start getting fully up and legalized and commercialized. And then, uh, and, and that sucks because like somebody could just say, well, hey, uh, I've got a patent lawyer that cost me, you know, $20,000. So Jack Frost is mine now. And there wouldn't be much I could do about it uh, other than like maybe appear in court and try to challenge it. But I don't have that kind of money to, to you know, compete with those kind of things. Uh, so we're just, you know, we're hoping for the best. And, uh, and, and I think, I think a lot of, uh, People that were growing cannabis before it legalized uh, got pushed out. Uh, a lot of people were excited about it getting legalized and then realized that they didn't have the financial power to compete with these big corporations that are jumping into it. Uh, like in, in Illinois, uh, where I am, uh, it, it's $100,000 for a, for a commercial production license. So like, like average Joe on the street can't produce cannabis. Like you can for yourself, if you have a medical card, you can grow like I think three or four plants under five feet tall for yourself. But to actually produce commercially, you have to have a license and the state gets big money for that. Wow. So like mom and pops growers are like, are out, you know, as far as that goes. But with, with the mushrooms, I mean, you can grow, I mean, like I, it's not legal and I'm growing them. So I, I don't know if being legal is going to change that for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yo, I got a question for you. Oops. Um, you, you said that your Jack Frost was a cross between ape, and I'm sorry, I forgot the other strain that you had mentioned. Uh, wombat um, tat. Wombat tat. Uh, beautiful strain, by the way. Good, good job on that. Uh, it's really nice. Uh, you said you, you got that from swabbing two different fruits with the same swab. Uh, I have a buddy who's been experimenting with that. You know, there's so much gatekeeping to this whole hybridization and and all that. And it's it really, I see people doing it as simple as just swabbing two fruits. And it kind of raises questions to me. Like It's so much easier. <laughs> it's so much easier than people make it out to be. Uh, the, the scientific way to do it is serial dilution. That's like the most controlled way where you separate individual spores and germinate them for, for the monocarians, and then you pair them to make the dicarion, which is your fruiting culture. Uh, and, and you have the most assurance that you've successfully crossed something when you do it that way because you can observe it with the microscope. Uh, but... Doing it the, what well, they call it the ghetto way, the, the double swab method is the ghetto cross because it doesn't take any technology. Like you don't need a microscope for it. You just, the, the principal factor is simultaneous germination between the two variety spores. You want them to germinate at the same time. So that's best done if they're both collected fresh at the same time. So often if I've got a couple of different things harvesting at the same time, I'll start one of those double swabs and put it to agar and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't there's a there's a higher contamination risk with not cleaning the culture before you send it to grain but getting two varieties spores on one swab and putting it in the agar is not really any different from just having one variety spores on the swab and putting it in the agar the spores germinate and they meet each other and they mate uh and so like it, it, you know a, a long time ago the the big myth was that you had to have like water moccasin venom in order to do any kind of crossing and that pretty much discourages anybody from being able to do it because they're like well fuck i don't have that shit you know but but it's it's so much easier than that and 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 then you might need that for like for like interspecies hybridization for things that won't mate naturally but uh, but cubes are, all, they're like dogs, basically. Like, they're different shapes and sizes, but they're all the same species, and they'll all have sex if you let them. So, so that raises my, my a second part to that question. It, since it is so much easier than some people are leading it on to, to be, how, how much do you need to keep that lineage whenever you're 
putting a new name to this new creation that you're that you're making and stuff and how do you ensure that things don't get lost when you're doing these multiple projects like you're doing oh my god it's a hot mess uh i don't write anything down uh so i've got like the history of everything that i've worked on is in my head um and i'm supposed to be working on a book uh i've got i've got a basic outline and i'm i'm collecting pictures for different parts of the process and 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 sorting and and organizing them but i haven't started writing out the individual chapters yet but i am i am working on a book uh on on my process for uh trait stabilization and breeding um and it it's you know it's it's tough like like with the case at project like my first my first tub of it produced like three or four different tubs of different isolations and then i had to choose between like which i wanted to keep going which i didn't like if i you know if i liked them if i didn't like them uh and i have a problem with liking everything uh so so things snowball out of control pretty quickly um like like uh, and this recent case at tub that produced like 10 or 11 different isolation projects like i'm gonna have a whole bunch of case at things coming up here in the near future uh and hopefully I'll be able to keep them all straight. But uh, it, the lineage is important, though. Like I, I feel like I feel like the biggest problem with that is people just randomly renaming things without doing anything to them. Like, say you grow a, a Melmac, and uh, you decide you want to sell it, so you don't want to call it just Melmac. You want to call it Bill's Melmac or whatever. But is it any different from any other Melmac? Like I don't know. You know. Uh, it, but as long as it's still Melmac. You're, you're carrying that lineage forward. Uh, and, and I try to be transparent with that. Like, uh, I've got a couple of mystery varieties that I don't know where they came from. And I, I try to be upfront about that too. Like, I honestly don't know what they are. Uh, but if I do know what they are, I try to make sure that information is carried forward. Because uh, a lot of people like, like are, are, you know, they go into the mushroom collecting, basically. Like, a lot of people have a collection of spore prints, and they don't actually grow hardly any of them. they got one or two varieties that they grow on a regular basis. But they want to collect this this whole collection of things. And, and you know, people like to collect stuff. And, and I think it's important to keep that lineage straight uh, just so so you can know where stuff came from. And I, I, I you know, I don't know. I, I try to come up with names that are descriptive, but also include some of the lineage whenever possible uh, like uh like like i've got this albino uh that came from the tam project the tat uh tat melmac cross that produced gandalf and i named it tambino because i wanted to, to keep that in the name you know it's descriptive and includes the the lineage So I, I have a question about um, Melmac. So not to get into any particulars about Melmac, is is the story I was told, and I, I was made a little fun of, but Melmac is a planet, or is a person that lives on a planet Melmac, or some shit like that. And it's like, you could find Melmac characteristics in any cube, or any type of... Uh, like low low oxygen environment cube, like they will show those tendencies of stretching, and different um, transfers, different isolations. H have you seen that in in many? I, like I don't know, like specifically Melmac, but like Melmac is a PE. It's a it's a penis envy variant, and the penis envy qualities are are definitely possible in a lot of different varieties. Uh, like like uh in the tat family uh yeti is basically an albino pe of sorts but it comes from golden teacher origins but it's got the same dick like shape yeah. and uh and it's it's got the same kind of rubbery density and extra potency and uh and it's just it's just a matter of like looking for them like in the wild like your your natural cube is the outdoor type you know like the regular b plus type that grows outdoors but those, i think those mutations aren't... mutations come up like albinos or or slower growing pe type things those mutations happen randomly but they don't survive outdoors like they're not they're not like they're just not 
tuned for outdoor environments. Like they grow too slowly, they would get roasted by the sun yeah. uh, before they had a chance to produce spores. Uh, so but I've in controlled that, indoor conditions, then you can actually isolate these traits and 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 nurture them and get them to grow. But if you if you take like regular uh, like Melmac and put it outside, you might get some Melmac fruits in the beginning, but after a couple generations, they're going to shift back towards regular outdoor cubes. I've and I've noticed the the hollowness. That's more of the Melmac trait, where they grow more hollow than a uh, a more wild cube, where they're more dense, they're a thicker of a stem. Where the Melmacs kind of stretch, and they they have more of a they take after more of their tubular genetics, where they're hollow. I've seen I've seen some that don't though. There's like uh, like I've got this Choda this Choda Melmac from uh, <laughs> Choda <laughs> <laughs> from Chris Aaron, and uh, and it grows some just phenomenal looking fruits, but they're huge. But they end up being lighter than you'd expect when you put them on the scale because they are like severely hollow. But then I've had other ones like other varieties that are just like rock solid all the way through. Yeah, and that, and they weigh a ton. So it's, I think it's just a genetic, uh, just a genetic quirk. Like, yeah, different the different isolation of a different perk of of its evolution. That, that, but like, that's like, like doctoring for, uh, the development. There's so many different developments that cubes can go through when like uh, isolating for potency, isolating for yield, uh, for characteristics. You know, for even for mutation. You well, and I look for I look for everything. Like I, if there's a if there's a cap that has like a funny shape to it, like it gets cloned. Like if there's a even just a slightly off color, I clone it. Like every little every little thing. One cap might have more ripples than another cap around the edge, and I'll clone it. Like just to see if I can capture it. And and sometimes sometimes you capture it. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you end up capturing something else that you didn't know about. Uh, in the in the following grow like like El Choco El Choco was was supposed to just be a darker colored cap so my my goal with that one was I always took spores from whatever caps were the darkest in the tub but somehow slower growth and density came along with that over a few generations they just got shorter and thicker yeah that that, that and that's just and not saying it's a, uh, a stroke of luck but it's a it's a it's following the breadcrumbs of the healthy the strongest the more defining characteristics of, of that mycelium. Well, yeah, and I'm not, and I'm not always looking for like, like potency, but potency mm. tends to follow weirdness. Like anything that's <laughs> different from normal tends to be stronger. Like, like even a even a regular albino that's not particularly slow growing seems to have a little bit more kick to it than like a regular B plus mushroom. So like it's just you know you you just the weirder it gets the better it gets and like somehow for some reason like these really little ones like like ghost uh, tat black caps uh, they're little mushrooms and people grow them for the first time and they're like what the fuck are these are they gonna get any bigger and I'm like just eat them just <laughs> eat them you don't need very many <laughs> they're fucking strong yeah. and they're they're little but they're also dense too they're very thick and rubbery for their size like they they pack a lot of mushroom into a small package. Yeah, I was very, I was very thankful to get a um, a tat from a friend of mine. I don't know if you know uh, Nola. Uh, uh, shit, uh, Justin Langley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, he's a uh, kind of like my like my mentor. He put me on to you want to you want to make money growing mushrooms, provide for your family. This is how you do it. Like here's the here's a script, kid. So that kind of pushed me to actually let this not be a hobby, but something that pays the bills, keeps the lights on. So, and I, I totally appreciate the, uh, like how much work you do for, you know, for, for everything. Well, and that's, that's something that we didn't really touch on in my interview is that I, I didn't plan on doing this for a living. Uh, I was always a, a restaurant manager or a chef. And like, I really enjoyed that. Uh, up until the pandemic hit, like I, I did some spores on the side as like a little bit of a side hustle. I'd, I'd you know throw a couple swabs out here and there, but it wasn't it wasn't a living by any means. But but then then the pandemic hit. My my chef job got shut down like everything else did, and then immediately following that, I got hit with some medical problems. I had a real bad lung infection, and as soon as that passed, I ended up 
having this diverticulitis and going in for emergency surgery. So I've been pretty much laid up for the last couple of years. And, uh, and, and the, the hobby turned into a living just out of necessity uh, because I had to figure out how to work from home because I wasn't functional to, to do much else. Uh, uh, and now, uh, now I've, I've had my follow-up surgery and I think I'm pretty much 100% human again. Uh, <laughs> And and I've been looking at jobs. Oh, yeah. I've been looking at jobs and like thinking about like, well, I could do that job, but I don't know when I would have time, because the the hobby has grown to fill up like I I've always I was always a workaholic, uh, managing restaurants is a like a, you know a, like a fifty five hour plus a week job, and uh, yeah, career. Work, working from home for myself like I I work twenty four hours a day like I work until I fall over. And I couldn't be happier, like, because it, when you, when you enjoy what you do, it doesn't seem like work anymore. And so like, I've, I've branched out into, you know, doing other things, like I'm making stickers and, and t-shirts and whatever else, but like, you know, micro related stuff, like just, just to have fun with it. Yeah. Uh, keep, and keep uh, that spirit pumping. And, and, and you know, it's something as, as silly as a sticker, like, you know, like when I first started selling swabs, I was buying packages of stickers on Wish for a dollar. I was buying packages of mushroom themed stickers off Wish. And, uh, and for a dollar, you would get like 50 stickers of just random yep. like cartoon mushrooms. And, and, and then I, you know, I, I got the equipment and started making my own, my own stickers and whatnot. I think, uh, are we getting lawn mowing here? Wolfman. Hello. <laughs> mute, your, mute your mic, Wolfman. You yeah, go. he was he was vacuuming. It's okay. Uh, I think. <laughs> but like, I, well, I started uh, I started uh, making the stickers to go with my mushrooms, uh, just because it it's it's something goofy, but it makes people happy. Like it's just you know it's a it's a like who likes stickers? Little kids probably and mushroom people. Yeah. Do any anyone who anyone who wants to be a not just be a part but show their gratitude and showcase like your favorite band. You're going to have a t-shirt of your, right. your, exactly. your, your, your favorite car. You want, you want to put what, what size engine it's hiding under the hood. It's what we do. Well, and, and then I was, I was, I was paying for, for stickers to get made. I was sending them off to, to sticker app or sticker mule. And, uh, and that was going well, except like I started having delays, like my Jack Frost stickers, like I needed more of them because I was trying to give one out with every set of swabs. And uh, and I ran out and it took them like a couple of weeks to fill my order and it drove me nuts. Uh, and then I ordered some other sticker that I had made and it was kind of a bad design. Uh, it looked good on the computer screen, but when it was actually printed, it looked like ass. And uh, and it was already you know, a hundred copies of it were printed and mailed to me. And I was like, well, this sucks. Uh, so that's when I decided to go out and get the equipment and start, uh, start making my own. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you did that. Well, I, part, I, it's just, I like to, I, I like to do everything, you know, I, I, I did it when I was managing restaurants too. Like there was no part of the restaurant that I couldn't, like I could run pretty much any restaurant single-handedly if I had to, I'd be real sweaty, but I could get it done. <laughs> i'm from i'm from uh uh north of the massachusetts so the the grind and the hustle and you know restaurants seem like second nature but i it's probably someone else wants to ask you something but nice talking to you bud i'll be here who's next I'm gonna send. I'm gonna send you a, a message too. Once you get a hold of this Discord thing, I'm... I guess I'll I'll ask a question. <laughs> Shoot. So, I uh, I've been giving Normac a lot of love, and I've been spreading the love of Normac to a lot of the people in this community. And you 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 said you get a lot of like big fruits from it, and it's slow fruiting. And uh, my Normac is actually like almost tat like like Cad said. It it throws the blue blue gills almost kind of looks like Jack Frost and it, yeah. it fruits fairly fast where people can't even catch like closed cap fruits. So have you like experienced anything like that while you while while you're running them or have you just gotten like the big boys? I've I've actually just gotten it back onto agar again. It's been like almost probably a year or two since I've run it, 
but uh it it was it was mostly it was mostly like solitary large fruits like i didn't get any full solid flushes it was mostly just like random giants oh man like yeah so i got it from you probably like i don't know eight months to a year ago and first flush i i, I got some big fruits and I just kept working it. Now I got like full canopies, almost like Jack Frost, like, and I, I mean, I've definitely gotten a few like chody hundred plus gram fruits and stuff, but most of the time, like Cad said, it's like spaghetti, dude. It, 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 and it's a sub grabber. That thing like just destroys cakes. Well, see, and I didn't, I didn't actually like, I didn't actually work the, the albino Normac too much. I only grew it a couple of times and I swabbed it and sent them back out the door, like as they were, uh, cause I, I don't remember what I was working on at the time, but I was focused on something else. So that was just kind of like a like a side thing. But I, I'm excited to get them going again because they I feel like they do have a lot of potential that I just now that I'm like getting back around to it, maybe I can focus on it and actually do some work with it. I'd like to see what you do with them, man, because a lot of people have been giving me reports and they say it's some of the favorite the like the favorite trips of their lives. And I've heard that from multiple people that I've sent the culture to. And then multiple people that they've, you know, given given it to to experience it. So I think I I'm, think I'm, I'm, I think I ahead, lost them. I lost them when I went in for emergency surgery. Like I, I lost a lot of things actually when I went in for emergency surgery a couple of years ago. Uh, I guess it was a year and a half ago, maybe it was March of uh, March of the year before last. I don't remember when it was. It was horrible anyway. It was bad memory. But I, I had a closet full of tubs, like I like I do now. Uh, and I wasn't planning on going to the hospital for, for 11 or 12 days. Uh, so when I left for the hospital, like emergency room, uh, I had, you know, probably a dozen tubs that were already ready to harvest. And, uh, so those, you know, they, they died and rotted and molded and the mold spread from those tubs to the next tubs. And when I got home, I had tubs that were just solid mold, like you couldn't even see into them like everything was shot and uh and 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 i just had like surgery and was attached to like a vacuum machine that i had to carry around with me to keep my wound shut and uh and so it, it took me like another week or two to actually even dump these tubs out and clean them i just had this like closet full of mold it was horrible uh but but normac was one of the one of the ones that got lost in that and i just never got around to starting it again until just now well i'm 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 fucking glad you're good, dude. Like that, that that's a scary situation. I followed a little bit of like all of that on, on Tad Syndicate on the Facebook page and stuff when they're posting about it. And uh, I'm pretty sure I bought some of the swabs and stuff to go towards uh, your medical recovery and whatnot. Yeah, it's weird, you know, because I'm usually like I, I I've always kind of felt like I'm indestructible, and uh, and then every now and then you get reminded that you're not. But uh, but now that I'm back whole again, I think I'm indestructible again. Uh, fingers crossed. Hey, and, dude, and it was just it was just kind of it was just kind of like a random fluke like it came out of nowhere i didn't have any any previous symptoms or anything just i i was actually i was i was hitting my dab rig and uh and coughing and on one of the coughs i felt a real sharp stabbing pain in my abdomen and and i thought it was just like a cramp or something and it and it went away pretty much immediately and i didn't think anything of it and then over over the next couple of days, I just started getting really, really sick and got to the point where I, I called somebody and said, I think I actually need to go to the hospital because I thought I had appendicitis. I thought my appendix burst or something. And uh, and it turned out it was actually intestinal rupture. And so there was Holy infection, shit. like infection throughout my torso and, and my uh, my entire digestive system had basically stalled. Like there was no, uh, the peristaltic motion that moves things through your gut as you swallow and, and it, you know, it kind of undulates and pushes things in your mouth and out your exit hole. Uh, that was dead. So I couldn't eat. Like if I ate, it didn't go anywhere. It just sat there. Like it wasn't, I could, I could swallow it like past my throat, but then it would stop in my esophagus. And, uh, and I was like, okay, well, I probably need to go see somebody. Damn, man. I'm not a religious guy, but fuck, thank the higher power that you're all right, dude. That's yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I definitely could have died. Like, uh, when I, when I got to the hospital and they, they did like their little scan on my body and said like, uh, surgery now is what we're going to do. Cause there's no waiting. Like this is immediate. Like, 
we're 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 going. <laughs> so so sign this, and I'm like, you got it. Like, let's go. I'm all for it. Well, dude, I I'm uh I I'd be blessed to give you some of my swabs that I got from uh, my Normac run just to see what you could uh, do with it. I know you I probably got your take handful, them. but I'm gonna give them to you because you're the, you're the OG for that, man. And I I like I said, dude, like I saw it on your, your your page, and I was like, that's like one of the biggest like it's just such a unique looking fruit, and you don't see anyone running it. So I I had to get my hands on it, you know. You know, and I feel bad for not running it too, like because I'm like, but I run so many things that it it doesn't occur to me until like somebody will be uh like talking to me and placing a sport, or and they'll ask about something, and I'll be like, huh, I haven't seen that in a while. Like, <laughs> I need to go get that on some agar. Yeah, dude, I've been running your Choco too, and that that like you said, man, those things are wild. Like, those things are some of the wildest fruits I've ever seen, and they're just thick, like woody, just solid little bastards. They they're surprisingly strong for a a variety that can still drop spores. I think. Oh, dude, mine haven't been dropping spores honestly, and uh, like I've I've tried leaving like I've tried leaving them on foil. They don't drop. They don't cover the like the tub at all, and they wipe off so thick with a like a swab that it's like uh, removing dirt from a window. It's like the yeah, wildest. Oh yeah, they turn they they do they produce a lot of spores. They don't drop them very well, but. But they do produce a lot of spores. Like they okay, turn so that that's swab common, black. Though, that they don't drop. Well, they they drop a little. Like I get it's not it's not anything like a like a like a B plus dump. I mean, okay. not at all. But but like like after I let a tub sit for a while, I'll see like little traces. You know where like the the spores get up on top of the cap and make little designs. Like right, you'll get right. some of that. But but they don't. I I haven't even tried printing them. All right, well, I'll let uh, someone else ask the question, man. I'll uh, I'll get in touch with you either on Facebook or Discord, whatever one's easier for you to Facebook. get like your your your, your details <laughs> to send these blobs, man. Actually, well, I, you know, it's a toss up. Like Facebook is where I am most of the time, but uh, my message box on Discord is probably a lot less overcrowded. Yeah, you say that now. Everyone is going to be hitting you up. Everyone in this Discord is going to be hitting you up. <laughs> that's, that's possible too. But I'll probably like post some kind of sale and then go back into hiding. So All right. That's, that's, well, that's my typical style. Well, man, I hope you stay healthy and uh, you continue the good work, dude. You take Thank care. Fingers crossed, man. I'm trying. Thank you. Hey, so um, can I ask a question too? Sure. All right. So I live in Pakistan and it's freaking hard as fuck here. And it's pretty humid as well. So it's the best environment for um, mold and other stuff for, you know, to germinate and stuff. So I was, I haven't still gotten to the fruiting part, but I am, um, I do have a few Emir clean cultures on me, which I got through learning agar and stuff. So when I go to the fruiting part, should I be expecting a lot of contam? Even though um, my grains are pretty clean. Um, I've been practicing them with oysters. They're pretty clean, and my agar attack is also pretty fine. I'm just worried uh, whether if I go to the fruiting stage, should I be expecting a lot of contempt because of the heat? I don't or... think so, really, because they, they do grow very well. Uh, they grow faster in, in hotter environments, but they the, the risk is uh, that bacteria proliferates quicker as well. Like So when you're doing your grains and your agar... Uh, yeah heat will definitely encourage bacteria to proliferate uh but i think if you've got your cultures clean mm -hmm. once you once you've got that if as long as your grain spawn is colonized and clean once it goes into the tub it should be fine you might you might find problems you know after a couple of flushes uh things might go bad quicker but you should be able to get through at least first and second flush without problems yeah yeah and also that a lot of folks claim that um, the popcorn tech, that's pretty convenient. So I really haven't gotten into that. I just use millets. I, I get them pretty cheap here and they work pretty good for me. So how is popcorn more convenient um, when you compare them to other greens? It's mostly just convenient for me. It's convenient because it's accessible. Uh, when mm -hmm. I go to the grocery store, it's there and it's cheap. But I know uh, like some people... Uh, I've talked to in uh, in the UK. Uh, popcorn is not as cheap there. Uh, it's it's more expensive. 
Uh, yeah. So it, and it just depends on where you are, and and in some places millet is going to be you know much more plentiful. Uh, so it's really any grain is good. Uh, just the preparation for it is different to get the hydration correct. Uh, but but every grain is fine. Like I haven't I haven't tried a grain yet that didn't work. Uh, I've I've had people ask about barley. And I've been told that barley is not a good choice, but I don't know why. I haven't actually tried it myself. But but most grains are are interchangeable as long as you get the the prep and the hydration for it right, and then sterilize it, then they're all functional. But yeah. the popcorn the popcorn is just my my go to because it's just when I go to the store to get food, I grab some popcorn when I'm there. So it's just you know it's convenient. Ah, uh, that's nice. That's that's great. It would be oh. cheaper for me to go to uh, it, like if I drive further, I can go to a, a feed store where I can buy big bags of oats and stuff like that, and it would probably be a lot cheaper. But but I I grow a lot of things, but on a very small scale. Like I grow a lot of really small tubs, so I don't I don't really cook a whole lot of grains at once. But I do I do make like maybe seven to ten jars of grain every day. So I mean I I, I guess it is like, <laughs> okay, I, guess I do do a lot of it. It's, yeah, I do a lot of small it, it batches. Like it. I do a lot of small batches, and I and I I make a batch of of agar, but only like five hundred milliliters, like just a small batch every day. Uh, yeah. So it is like a job at this point where I'm just it's a constant rotation. As soon as I empty the jars out into the tubs, then I have more jars to put grain in, and then I have more grain to put the agar in, and it it just kind of keeps recycling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I yeah, like that's... I like the popcorn also because the grains are very large and round, and uh, and and millet uh, also has that that shape. They're they're very round yeah. grains, and so when you when you go to break it up and shake it, it it breaks and shakes very easy compared to mm -hmm. uh, longer grains like oats are uh, are kind of long and you know pointy and they don't they're stickier so they don't shake as well. Like I find that the the popcorn shakes up a lot easier, and I think millet would too. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's right. And I also wanted to know uh, about how to get spores available for people around here without like putting me behind bars or getting me under the radar. Because um, getting spores from all the way from the west over here is it's, it's pretty hard. Even though even if you have like track shipment and stuff, they, most of the times they do get lost. So it was pretty hard for me to get a Ymir swab. Um, yeah, for me that's, too. I find Mexico is also a hard country. Uh, for some reason, yeah. their mail system uh, just things just don't get there. Uh, it, yeah. it is it is tough, like especially like you know different countries. Uh, you don't know uh, what they're looking for when things come in through customs or whatever. You know, uh, usually usually when I send my swabs, I just send them in a in a, a regular envelope with a greeting card. And and a lot of times it just goes through like a regular letter, but then you know, it's you don't know. Like the farther it goes, the more chance of <laughs> disappearing. So, um, does the the label for microscopy use only actually help, or is it like just there because why the fuck not? It's like it's like a disclaimer. Like obviously. If you grow them, then you're, it's not for microscopy purposes, purposes only, you know? Yeah. And, and I think everybody, like law enforcement included, knows that spore websites selling spores is for people to grow them. Nobody's just going to look at them under the microscope. Like, it's kind of silly. But I think it's more, it's more just to protect them as far as their, their web hosting goes than any actual legality. Like they can say like oh well we didn't we didn't you know we told people not to grow them or whatever but everybody knows you're going to grow them so i mean it's it's just kind of dumb yeah, yeah. like I've, I've never done it like some of the different groups insist on putting you know you have to put this you know not for sale or trade or microscopy purposes only you got to put that on everything i actually don't put it on anything uh because i think it's dumb so but i i also grow mushrooms illegally because they're not legal for me to grow, and I grow them. So, you know, I'm already a yeah. criminal as far as that goes. So I just have no worry about it. <laughs> well, thanks for answering my questions, Dave, and also thanks for the work you're putting in. And I'm a huge, huge fan. Thank you. Hey, and you know, I've 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 sent 
I've sent a couple of packages to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. I don't know for sure if they got there or not. <laughs> I probably know those folks, and the ones that got it uh, got me the Emir uh, culture, and I worked on it. And so they were doing this project thingy on their university where they were getting mycelium um, fractal dimensions through um, a uh, simulation, I guess, that they created through, I don't know, coding and stuff. So one of the person that was working on the mycology department in there, um, they were like, you know what, we're just going to grow the other stuff too. And I was interested. And I was like, yeah, let's get to it. So, yeah, thanks for the work you're putting in. And, yeah, it's been amazing. I'm going to uh, pass will, the... Yes. I, will try and, I will try and send you some... <laughs> I'll try and send you some mail if I can. <laughs> well, uh, Kat's been sending me mail since the last uh, four months, I guess. And he's, he's sent it, like, four times already. It never came here. And I do remember buying Lucy, like, 200 lots of California sunshine. And I never got it. And this random dude was holding my package from another city in fucking Pakistan and it was on his hand and I was like dude I hope your hands weren't sweaty yeah no I had Thanks. actually I had mailed uh I had mailed a package to a guy in uh where was he uh Bermuda the island yeah. of Bermuda and uh he uh he was very their uh, spores are illegal there. It's one of the places where spores are not legal. Like most places, the mushrooms are illegal, but the spores are legal. But there, uh, the spores are not allowed either. So we were a little nervous about, you know, mailing to them. So yeah. I sent the package and uh, they, they received them at the customs there. And they notified him and said, hey, we have a package here <laughs> for you. If you can come and tell oh, us no. what's in it. <laughs> then you can have it. And so he was oh, like, no. he was like, I'm not going, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to claim it. You know, I'm just going to let it go. Yeah. Uh, and then a year later, they delivered it to him. Like, wow. He just wow. like, out of the blue, it just showed up on his doorstep. So, uh, you know, I, maybe they just forgot what it was and sent it on its way. I don't know. But uh, yeah. it, it is always nervous. Uh, I know Australia has, uh, has some weird laws. And they they've got like a war on drugs going on uh, down there too. So like there's people getting raided for for stupid stuff, you know, and it's it's messing up people's lives. So people are a little bit nervous about it down there too. I mean, I mean, I bet the uh, the law enforcement here doesn't have uh, microscopes ready to measure out the spore size too. Get no, no, the, they don't. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, and sometimes with uh, with a couple of people in other countries, I've also relabeled things as uh, as gourmet, as oyster yeah. species, or or whatever, and changed the labels, and then you know later sent them a message with the decoder list of here's what you know blue oyster is this, and <laughs> you know pink oyster is that. <laughs> I mean, I mean the customs officers here probably don't know what gumbies or um, emirs are or jack they frost. They would not gonna, know what yeah. any of that stuff is. No. I, I hope not. Well, I actually hope they do because then they're cool. We're like, so this is, I've met a lot of people who have either started growing and stopped midway because how hard it is here or like um, they're just using sports ranges on AIO bags and then having a vomit bag on them. So I was thinking of um, getting those spores here, making it easier for people to have access to them since I've, you know, got my setup good here. Uh, it's a small setup, but it's working out. So, yeah, that's that's about it. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a good thing. You know, I, I there was a guy in Australia that yeah. I sent uh, like 600-something swabs to not too long ago uh, because just because most people down there are just too nervous to order them from overseas uh so actually having them in the country uh makes them a lot more accessible to people down there so uh yeah. i don't know maybe maybe that's not good for my australian sales uh in the long run but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's kind of true we, we do live people, in the capitalist system i forgot about that Oops. <laughs> as long as people are getting their mushrooms that's the important thing yeah yeah that's true man that's true i'm sorry but my perspective is on from a leftist, um, yeah, mindset. Well, and so they have, they have so that. many, they have so many varieties down in, uh, down in Australia that are are wild growing, like like really neat ones, but they're none of them are easy to grow. So, so as far as like trying to grow your own, like you can, I mean, you can go outside and look for them, but they're not always there, you know. So, uh, so cubes are definitely the easiest to uh, to grow at home. 
yeah yeah they definitely are um i guess i'm gonna give these emirs a try because that's the only thing i probably will have for the next six months but i'm i'm glad i have pretty good looking ones so <laughs> uh, the emir is good though that's a that's a yeah. good mushroom like they're it's like a giant jack frost basically yeah well it's like a a, a dad mutation only right Yes, yes, it's tat. pure. Yeah. It's 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 pure tat. There was no cross for that one. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. It, it honestly means a lot to talk to you since I've been following your stuff and been very active on Ashy Turd as well. <laughs> thanks, sir. That's a good, <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> probably my greatest contribution to the community is the Ashy Turd. <laughs> yeah, Ashy Turd is the best group on Facebook. Trust me. So, um, like you were saying, uh, these Australian cubes, uh, they're, they're hard to grow. Uh, do you think that has anything to do with, um, they're just not domesticated yet? Like everybody's been growing B positive for 30 years now, you know, uh, it's used to grow. I mean, one would think it is used to growing in tubs. Uh, it's been cultivated in tubs for hundreds of generations. Uh, do you think, uh, with a little bit more work? some of these wild cubes uh could be you know house trained well it's not it's not the cubes it's the down and down in like australia and new zealand they've got like all these like sub selectoids and and sub aruginoses and fucking wereroas and other weird wood growing things you know and uh and i you know i don't know because like like natalensis is a is a pretty cool example where it's it's very close to cubes and it grows under the same condition so it's a little easier to work with but just in the short time that that natalensis has been going around the community uh there's already like a few different looks popping up now like at first everybody's looked like spaghetti and uh and now we're starting to get some that are like looking pretty beefy uh so so it's possible you know i mean i don't know like like uh if it was easier to grow some of these wood lovers like we could we could do it a little quicker but like some of them have to sit for a long time before they actually produce anything uh some of them some of them don't produce until the next year after you put them in the ground you know so it's just it's it's tough with those like the cubes are just they're so fast they're so fast that you can you can you can play with them uh but like this uh this wild mexican red spore that i'm working with uh it it came to me uh just a couple generations from wild uh, like I think the guy who got it in Chile might have grown it a couple times before he sent me a print. Uh, but it's it's definitely like wild. Like it's it just does not know how to behave. Uh, I I've gotten it to actually grow the red spore fruits a couple of times, but most of the time it it shits out like a, a random assortment of of mixed albinos and leucistic fruits and and other weird things. Uh, so I I don't I don't know I haven't I haven't worked with a whole lot of wild species so I've got I've got a few uh, I've got a few prints for for different uh, different exotic like wood lovers and stuff and I've got some of them started on agar but I haven't actually fruited any of them I tried to fruit some eleni and uh, they turned out to be cubes uh, which really grow like shit on wood chips I'm not gonna lie uh, they did grow but uh, not very well, but they did turn out to just be cubes. So I don't know if, if I contaminated the print with other cube spores during the process or something. I don't, I don't know what happened there. Uh, but so far, that's my, that's my experience with non, non-cubensis non species. And I've, I've grown a couple of natalensis tubs, uh, but, but I've mostly focused on cubes. Natalensis absolutely humbled me. Uh, we started this little grow along. Uh, Yoshi hooked me up with 40 prints. Uh, we sent them all over the world. Uh, I failed at every single corner on your <laughs> Uh And I, I consider myself good at what I do, man. Uh, and they really kicked my ass. Um, we, we do have this guy uh, in the gene pool. He goes by uh, Holofractal. Uh, he actually has his own separate channel in there. Uh, he does nothing but wood lovers and he does them indoors. Uh, he did some amazing Alani, uh, where Roa 
uh, he's just doing crazy things. And uh, as he keeps progressing, they get better and better and better. And uh, you should check out his images sometime. Uh, I've seen, I've really seen a couple of them. Does. I've seen a couple, I've seen a couple of his picks shared, like, and uh, yeah, I, I, I want to get there. Like I, I, I need to, I've got some wood. <laughs> I've got some wood and I've got some cultures. I just got to put it together. I think the one, the one, uh, I, I, the Wararoa is one that I want to do because it's the pouch fungus. Like it, it's just, it's so different. Like its shape is so much different from, uh, from like your traditional cube mushrooms. But, uh, but yeah, really, I want to, I want to grow everything. Like I've, I've got the same drive to, to grow everything. Like it applies to whatever I'm looking at. Like I, I was at the store looking at cacti the other day and I wanted all of them. Uh, I, I, I only bought one, but, uh, and it stabbed me numerous times on the way home. So I can only imagine if I'd bought a dozen of them. Okay. So Dave, uh, pause here. Uh, I just wanted to say like, you, you know, it's really refreshing, um, to hear how down to earth you are about everything. So like, that's, that's new, you know, uh, I think I've been involved in the community for maybe about a year now. Um, so thank you for that and thank you for what you do. And quite honestly, I'd never heard your name, but I have heard of your genetics. Um, so this is just, you know, an eye opening experience. Um, but me and my girlfriend, we're sitting here listening to, you know, this whole situation that we have here. And we were just wondering, you know, you said you were kind of more into the restaurant business. Um, and this kind of came on due to the situation. Happy that you're healthy. Um, but she was wondering, uh, is it, do you use like mushrooms medicinally? And if so, how often, if you're willing to share? I actually had to take, uh, I, I didn't have to, but I felt the need to take uh, a good year off from, from eating any mushrooms. Uh, cause I had this digestive surgery, uh, over the last, over the last year. And, uh, I had a really restricted diet. Like I was like on nursing home food basically, uh, for a long time. Uh, very simple, like mashed potatoes and like soft fish with no seasoning on it, like really, really simple stuff. And, uh, and, and mushrooms were not on my list of allowed foods because they, you know, cause digestive problems. Uh, uh, and, and now that I've had the second surgery, now I'm, I'm back to my, my full self again, and I, I can eat mushrooms again. Uh, so this is a wonderful thing. Like I've been missing it. Uh, I did have a lot of acid though, so I, I was eating a lot of acid while I was uh, while I was laid up with the surgery thing. And I don't know if that was a good idea either, but uh, it didn't didn't do anything to my stomach. I know that. Um, but uh, but usually usually my my normal uh, routine is I'll I'll trip once or twice a week, and it's usually seven to ten grams of whatever the strongest mushrooms I have are, uh, which is probably a little excessive but uh but i like it like that so <laughs> it's like the microdosing <laughs> thing is really neat uh, i think that's a really cool thing i've never actually tried it i've always been a macro doser uh but i feel like the same benefits that you get from micro dosing you get from the large dose as well and you get like a time release kind of thing like the same way it takes time for your tolerance to go back down after you take a large dose uh the, there's like an afterglow basically so like you, you take that that big dose and you kind of get beat up for a number of hours but then you feel great for like a week or two after that so uh and then there's there's a tolerance when you're taking high doses like a couple times a week there is a tolerance factor like like 10 grams of mushrooms doesn't hit you like 10 grams of mushrooms if you had it a few days previous uh it's 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 kind of diminished but it's still 10 grams of mushrooms so it's there's enough of it that it still kicks your ass. But it, now that I've had time off, uh, I ate a couple grams the other day and it kicked my ass. Like, I don't know if I could eat 10 grams of mushrooms right now because uh, my tolerance is back down. Uh, so I'm going to have to work back up to that. <laughs> I did I did go on a little run uh, once where I was doing uh, 10 grams a day every morning. I was just uh, cooking them up fresh, slicing them up, cooking them into an omelet. Wow. And uh, I tell you what, uh, that was the weirdest fucking week of my life. Uh, I thought I was a superhero. Like I was, 
I was, I wasn't, there was no visual hallucinations at that point. Like it was just like, it was all feel, uh, and, and like thought process, uh, weirdness. But, uh, I, you know, I like, I pulled off on the side of the highway and I was getting like debris off the road so people wouldn't run over it. And like, I just, you know, I was out there trying to, try, <laughs> trying to, trying to save the world. Um, and I thought about, uh, driving down South to where there was a hurricane and, and, and helping, uh, rescue people, but then I talked myself out of it and uh, and went back home. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's probably it's probably not good to eat ten grams a day. Uh, there might be some eventual like damage from that. I'm not sure. Like psychologically, mm -hmm. uh, it de definitely it definitely left a dent on my tolerance for a while. Uh, but I, I yeah, like since since the surgery thing, I haven't worked my way back up to that yet. I'm still I'm still taking acid more often than anything else. Uh, cause some of the, some of the mushrooms kind of scare me. I've got some, I've got some ones that I've been setting aside that I want to try. And, uh, and I just haven't been able to find the right time to where I feel comfortable, like doing it. You know, I've, I've also, you know, I'm a, I'm a single parent, so I've got a kid to take care of and I got to coordinate things with the rest of my life. Uh, but I do, I do have plans to try, uh, my Loki my Loki mushrooms are one of the next ones I want to try. Uh, and they're, they're one of my, one of my, uh, it's, it's a mutation that came from the emir isolation. Uh, but it's a, it's a very short, uh, ghosty looking cap with a blue ring around the, around the edge of the cap. And, uh, they, they just look very, very evil and, uh, right. gnarly and they don't produce spores most of the time. So they've been kind of difficult for me, uh, as far as getting them to, to cultivate goes. Uh, so I haven't, like, I think I've let a few people have some maybe swabs that might work, uh, just to see if, uh, if they can get them to grow. But when I look under the microscope, I see, like, I'm lucky if I find, like, one, one or two spores on any particular cap. Hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's definitely interesting to hear someone so seasoned say the exact things that i'm saying like uh there are some that just scare me so it's good to to hear that you have that respect um and that you've had your superhero moments um and that you've kind of made it <laughs> where you are now you know? um but yeah you know that's that's pretty much all i had so I, I do appreciate your time and i appreciate uh you know you answering my questions and such Anybody else got anything? I got I a question. I don't know if I... Oh, sorry. Oh, it's just going to be a real quick one. Um, Dave, uh, thanks, obviously, for coming by and spending some time with us. Um, if How does someone who doesn't have Facebook uh, get in contact with you, let's say, if they want to purchase uh, swabs or something from you? Do you have, like, a store, online store, anything no. like that? No, no, you just got to talk to me directly, which I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get into this discord thing. It's just new to me, but I do want to be accessible through here. Uh, I just need to actually get on here and, and do it. Like okay, I install so it. Through, uh, Facebook. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty much just it. I, you know, I dabbled with Reddit for a minute. I tried Reddit, uh, and, and Reddit, uh, frustrated me to no end. The phone app for Reddit is absolute trash. And it, it just, it drove me nuts. So I still actually have like some, some stuff on Reddit and I get messages on there all the time, but I don't answer them because I, I hate Reddit. Uh, so if anybody listening is, is trying to reach me on Reddit, uh, don't cause, cause I'm not there, but, uh, I should probably just go in and delete that stuff. But I do, I do want to be accessible on here too. Uh, we were talking about, uh, discord as a, as a possible alternative to Facebook. If Facebook started censoring the mushroom groups, which has been, you know, a concern. Because every time Facebook doesn't doesn't update, they uh, they start flagging posts and 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 you know, uh, suspending accounts and stuff. Uh, but usually, it's just like it's it's like a wave that happens for a couple of days and then it blows over. So I don't think the mushroom groups on Facebook are in any real danger. Uh, but I still want to be accessible. You know, not everybody's on Facebook. Uh, and and like I wasn't on Facebook for years, like I I was boycotting it, so I totally understand uh, not being there. 
Uh, but yeah, uh, you can message me on here, and I, I plan on going through my messages on here tomorrow, and and because there's a bunch. Uh, <laughs> but but I will I will be uh, taking messages on here and uh, and taking care of people as well. All good. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Uh, my pleasure. That was a perfect question. I was going to touch on that 100%. I don't have no Facebook, and I was hoping you would branch out to the dark side and hang out with us people on Discord a little more. Yeah, I'm I'm trying. I just uh, got it. It's it's. I've got this like goal where I I sell, I tell myself in the morning like, okay, I'm going to go into my Facebook Messenger and I'm gonna I'm gonna take everybody's orders, and then I I start. You know, I'm a big fucking chatty patty, and I start talking to everybody. And I only get through like two or three people and then it's like getting dark outside and I'm like, fuck, now I got to make dinner. Uh, so you know, maybe if I wasn't so friendly, it'd be easier. Uh, there was a, there, there was a, a guy doing a, doing a, a fundraiser sale on Facebook a while back that told everybody in the initial sale post, when you message me, message me with what you want, your payment information and your address and don't say shit else because I'm not going to talk to you. You're just going to hold up the process. And I, and everybody was like, Oh, you're a dick. Like, but I totally understand where he was coming from because trying to go through, like trying to run a business through a messaging system is a pain in the ass. Like, uh, every time somebody messages you, it pushes everybody else's messages further down the queue. And it's just, it, it gets lost, you know, it's, it's a hot mess. But, uh, I keep telling myself once I get through all my Facebook messages, then I'm going to go over to Discord, and I just never get through them. So we're going to switch that up now, and I think tomorrow I'm going to do my Discord messages and then go to Facebook. Oh, yeah, we, we're just we're just going to come at it from a different angle. So, so I don't know if you answered this earlier when I asked you or uh, or not. I'm sorry, <laughs> but what what is it that you have to do before you're allowed to to name something according to you like versus crosses or uh, i'm sorry crosses versus isolations in particular everybody wants to name their isolations i feel like you should be able to name a cross but isolations i'm not really too sure about that i want to ask your opinion on that well i'm I, looking at it from a hobby perspective like i I grew by myself without talking to anybody for a long time. And I came up with all kinds of weird nicknames for shit. And I would label things, you know, like either based on what they looked like, or, you know, I might name something Bob or something, you know, and, and just to keep track of it. Uh, and I feel like, I feel like everybody has the, has the right to name their stuff, whatever they want. As long as there's like some transparency as to the, the origin of it. Like you can tell people, Hey, this is Bob. Uh, he's a Cambodian isolation, you know? So like, then you have the, the history there. And then with the crosses, there's, you have a little bit more leeway because it's, it's a newer thing. Like it's not just a reworked thing of something else. It's like a, a new combination of genetics. So you have a little bit more leeway with the naming. Uh, but I, I really, I feel like anybody can name things whatever they want, but it's, it's just, it's up to the community as a whole whether it'll actually end up being recognized as a variety in the long run uh like is it like is it your cambodian is just a little bit different from everybody else's cambodian but is it going to be enough that anybody else will notice it you know uh or is it going to be desirable like with uh well, like with jack frost it was you know it had a very striking look to it it looked significantly different from everything else that was out at the time and uh and and having a catchy name, you know, obviously is is nice for it too. And then and then I came up with a, a cool stupid sticker to go with it that made people happy. So it was like it was like a combination of things there. But but I feel like you can name anything. Anybody can name anything whatever they want. And if other people recognize it as that name and start asking for it, like you see posts on Facebook where people are like, "Hey, I'm looking for this" or "I'm looking for that." Like when people start asking for stuff. Uh, or looking for it, that's a sign that it's desirable and and wanted by people. So, uh, but I, I, you know, I've got a whole lot of things that I've worked on that are are unique isolations that I've named things that uh, nobody has any interest in, uh, and they just sit in my box, and and that's cool. I'll just keep growing them because I like them. But uh, if somebody else wants them, they're there. 
but not everything is uh, quite as catchy as Jack Frost. So <laughs> just uh, El Chaco was a, a weird one in that in that regard because uh, when I first started the El Chaco isolation, everybody was just really starting to get crazy about albinos. The the tat scene was was blowing up. Uh, uh, Avery albinos had just come out not too long before that and so like albino isolations were like all the rage and then here i come with this dark shitty brown thing and i'm like look it's el chaco and people are like what the fuck is that uh and so it really didn't gain any traction like for the first like probably year or two that i had it available like not very many people picked it up uh but now that those people have actually grown it out a few times and there's multiple people posting grows of it now it's getting to be more recognizable and uh and so people are, are starting to recognize it when they see it now and ask for it. You you had mentioned that one and uh, Ebola as well mentioned that one saying that it, it was a especially crazy was the word you guys were using. What is it that makes it so crazy or unique or whatever? What is it that gives it something special? Well, being like dark and hairy uh, was uh, are the two most obvious like uh, traits for it. The cap has like kind of a hairy texture to it, uh, but it's a uh, it's got some other weird traits to it. Likes to grow underground. Uh, it has a tendency to pin underneath the subsurface, and then when you pick it, like there's like a, a good half inch to an inch of stem underneath the substrate, and it picks out like a big chunk of sub with it too. Like they really grip the substrate bad. It it likes to side pin. It doesn't matter if you have a liner or not. It likes to grow on the bottom and the sides of the tub. Like it's just it's just fucking weird. Uh, and and then I've got some I've got some uh, I've got some some weird uh, some giants out of it too. Like it's it's uh, it's it's still developing. Like there's it's just I feel like uh, it's it's just now starting to come into its own. And uh, and and maybe I was a little bit. Uh, rushed when i first released it because it's uh it's evolved a lot since then uh the el chaco that i'm putting out now is is definitely different from what i was putting out a couple years ago it's, it's really interesting how you, you find that one unique phenotype within you know, like you said you get the numbers and then you see that one that's like oh that's interesting and you try to propagate that one unique one and sometimes the magic happens and sometimes it doesn't is there something that you can do to kind of heighten the odds in it actually taking off and propagating that unique feature or is it just a luck of the draw type deal and you know it's i don't know like sometimes like i feel like i get lucky a lot but i don't know if that's actually just luck or if it's just if it's just the mechanics of mushroom growing and i'm just used to doing it so much that it, it works for me but i i feel like there's there's some randomness in the spores there's always going to be some randomness in the spores that's like a, a that's like a evolutionary like survival tactic so that like when a mushroom grows outside and dumps its spores into the wind like they're going to land everywhere in all kinds of different places and just having that randomness in their genetics allows them to adapt to survive in different conditions wherever they might land uh but for us indoors like we can we can really like hone in on those like focus on those little traits and, and isolate them a lot easier in controlled conditions so uh, growing from multispore is is a big one uh like that's that's really like the best way because like when you when you're doing the transfer thing uh the numbers are are stacked towards the same like mutations are going to be our, our, our smaller percentage chance. So when you're when you're doing transfers and you're you've got your multi spore plate and then you take your T1, T2, T5, whatever, you're you're reducing the number of genetics, but you're doing it blindly. So like you really just don't know what you're selecting. You could you could be honing it down towards that mutation, but you don't know. And so statistically, when you do a bunch of transfers, you're more likely to get what's normal for the variety and not what's different so so growing from multi-spore you take a little bit more contamination risk but you're a lot more likely to get that one weird fruit that grows different from all the other ones That's awesome. but you have to give up you have to give up your hopes of the canopy in the process <laughs> so you, you, 
you definitely have to fucking i mean i've gotten some good canopies off of multi-sport but there are so few and far in between in comparison that's for sure i i would definitely rather see like a tub of mixed weirdos though like it's, it's more entertaining to me than seeing like a solid layer of the same looking caps yeah, I definitely love hearing that you're you're an advocate for multi-sport because most people anymore, especially, they're like, no, you have to have an isolated monoculture, otherwise you're wasting your time, this and that. Well, and they that's 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 kind of like that. Uh, that's the gatekeeping thing. Like, it's kind of like you have to do what I say. Like, and and you don't. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it's it's a hobby. Like, it's supposed to be fun. And so, like, my my methodology is like kind of backwards to what everybody else has been preaching as far as like cultivation techniques uh and and those those are good practices as far as like if you're growing a regular cube like a b plus or a golden teacher uh your best bet to get a good canopy is to you know whittle it down to a, to a single genetic and and it'll be a big tub of boring same mushrooms uh but uh, you know i'd rather take the contam risk and and see what happens I got one more question I'd really like to ask you. I don't want to hog too much of your time because there's a lot of people in here. But, uh, you said you the number is five. You like to propagate something five times before you consider it stable. Do you always revert back to spores during those uh, in between those, or do you consider going from a clone to to uh, agar or whatever you're doing? Also, one of those five. Well, doing doing a clone is is kind of like repeating the same generation again. So like it doesn't count as far as like your F1, F2, those are your your filial generations. Uh, those have to be from spore in order to count. Because uh, if okay. you take fruits from your F2 grow and you clone them, then you're basically just producing another F2 grow. Uh, and and sometimes it's not necessary to go five generations to see something stable. Like like with Jack Frost, like it was the same on generation one as it was on generation five. Uh, so I mean, I, but but I felt more comfortable knowing that it was going to repeat. You know, like I could have released it on generation one, but I would have been sweating, wondering what people were going to grow from it. So mm -hmm. so it's 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 more for your for your own like satisfaction to know that you can be confident in what you're producing uh will be will be stable for people but like then there's other things like uh like the ksat for example uh when i was first working with that one i went to well, i was probably on like generation seven or eight and it had something completely different every time and uh and i was you know that drove me nuts to where i went back to the original spore print for the first generation and started it over uh because uh, for whatever reason there's there's a randomness gene in the in the tat uh and if you happen to get it like in your in your isolation like it's like randomness eternal like you just like if you if you have like something that pops up and you clone it and it comes up random from the clone that you cloned like you can probably guarantee that it's going to be random for the next couple generations too like there's just there's like a weird wild card gene in those tats that uh it's fantastic. I mean, I, I'm not complaining. It's it's absolutely wonderful, and, and and like the 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 isolations that you get from it, like they all seem to stabilize pretty well. So I think like once you get away from whatever that particular combination is that creates the randomness, then you can stabilize. But for whatever reason, the KSAT project was carrying it forward every generation, and I could not get it to sit still for nothing. Which and, and really, if I was just, if I was just growing for my own for my own benefit, I would happily just grow from that original tat print over and over again, uh, and just have tubs of randomness. Uh, the tat seems to be like kind of where y'all made y'all's legacy from, and kind of ever ever giving gift, if you will. I wonder how many more strains there are like that. There, master cultures or whatever you want to call it, that just offer endless possibilities like that. I feel like there are like I'm I'm getting some I'm getting some really good different stuff out of uh Huautla genes now. Uh and I just started working with those in the last uh in the last year or two. But I've gotten some some really neat stuff out of those and I feel like the potential is there in a lot of genetics but 
the tat genetics have been worked more by more people like like more people have like committed themselves to working that particular line uh than than any other like like most things are just grown over and over again and not like really like works for isolations they're just reproduced over and over again uh so i think i think just the focus on the tat uh the tat varieties has really boosted up the the amount of variety in that line but I think I think there's others with potential like Melmac. There's a lot of Melmacs out there. Like that's another one that's very heavily worked. Uh, and there's a lot of di very different Melmac isolations out there. Well, monsters too. Yeah, they are monsters. I've got some non-monstrous Melmacs though. Like I've got some I've got some smaller growing like like skinnier ones that come from it. Uh, the Gumby, for example, is kind of a narrow growing like bullet capped version but then uh but and, and it came from melmac tp which is typically like big turnip looking monsters dave it was really nice talking to you man i don't know if i introduced myself uh i go by metal heady around here on discord and i hope to see you around here more uh thanks again for your time buddy i'm gonna try to be I did have to take the I did have to take the Discord app off of my phone because it was driving me fucking nuts. So I've got it just on the computer now. But there is a way where you can turn the notifications. You can turn those on. Those things I, do get annoying. There probably is. There, <laughs> that's, that's a good feature to have. Oh, and that was another thing I was going to do on here is I've got uh, I've I've got these uh, these Wombat Labs glass petri dishes uh, that I've been selling. Uh, that uh, they're mostly like you know I've got most of my sales going through Facebook for that, but I've got a few cases of them left, and I was gonna I was gonna come on here and make them available here as well. Uh, so anybody that's looking for some glass petri dishes, uh, the deal on those is is you get a, a set of ten dishes and uh, and two two choices of, of swabs to go with them for 50 bucks. And that includes the priority shipping in the United States. If you're outside of the United States, we'd have to figure out some other, some other compensation for the shipping. I usually just add more swabs to the deal so that uh, it still comes out like uh, affordable. But, uh, but yeah, I do have, I do have these uh, glass Petries and I've got some media bottles too. I've got like a few hundred, uh, 500 milliliter and thousand milliliter media bottles. Uh, that are also possible in combination with the petri dishes. So uh, we'll make those available uh, coming up here pretty soon. Are your media? Do your media bottles have the sandblasting on them too? No, the media bottles are just plain. I was I was gonna get those uh, with the with the logo on them. But I couldn't reach the the factory's uh, minimum order quantity was uh, a a number of media bottles that would be like a pile bigger than my house. I uh, wouldn't know what to do with them, so I, I just I just got a few cases of unbranded. They're just they've got like the measurement lines on them, and that's it. And is that is that again something you just got to hit you up for, or do you have a store or something to get this kind of stuff? Yeah, up? no, you just got to hit me up. Uh, and I don't need to. I, I never like planned on being like a like a laboratory supply either, but it's more just for fun, you know. And uh, and also to encourage uh, people to use reusable stuff because you know a lot of us in the in the community use disposable plastic, uh, you know, petries that. You know, you you buy five hundred of them in a box, and you you know they you you use them for a week, and then they go in the trash. And uh, and uh, I, I've always been a, a a big proponent for uh, for you know green stuff and recyclables. And uh, before before petri dishes, I always did no pours in uh, in little jelly jars, like half pint and quarter pint wide mouth jars for for my plates. And uh, and you can just wash them and use them again, and it's uh, you're not throwing stuff in the garbage all the time. So, uh, and the glass plates are nice. Uh, they're, they're definitely an, 
an improvement over the over the jelly jars as far as visibility goes. But uh, but yeah, it's it's mostly just to encourage people to to branch out and 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 try reusable stuff. Do you have any kind of a, a higher contamination rate? With glass petri dishes over plastic petri dishes, or do you just not even use petri or plastic petri dishes, so you don't have a comparison? I, I've used them a couple times in the past, but uh, but no, they're they're like they they work just fine. Like I haven't noticed any difference in uh, in performance as far as that goes. Oh, they are kind of scary to wash. Like mm. there's there's that part. Like you do have to wash them uh, between uses, uh, so. But I use a I use a like a baby bottle brush, and I just I don't I don't actually submerge the dishes in the sink because once you put them underwater, they're invisible. Uh, so, but I just keep them stacked up next to the sink, and then I just kind of swish them out with the brush and rinse them and and stack them up to dry. Uh, but they are they are nice. Uh, they they're the glass is sexy. Like it, it doesn't work any better than the plastic, but it looks cool. And then it's also reusable, so there's that. Yeah. Although if I could find a deal on some reusable like polypropylene dishes, I would I would I and I'm I might look into that for my next for my next like labwares purchase. I might see if I can get like a some kind of deal on on reusable plastic dishes because they're they are out there but they're not very common. Like mostly you find yeah, the poly the polystyrene ones that can't survive the PC. The PP five ones are the ones that Mendo Mico really advocates for, those plastic ones. Yeah, anything anything reusable is good. Like I just I I feel like I already generate way too much trash. So I'm assuming you don't do bag grows then, huh? I do a few. Like it's it's mostly tubs, but I do like bags come into play when uh well like if I'm doing oysters, like every time I'm doing oysters or lion mane, I always do my edibles in a bag. Uh but uh but sometimes, like I'll, you know, I'll be jarring up the grains and, and getting ready to PC it, and I've got like enough grain for a couple more jars, but I don't have any more jars, so it'll just I'll throw it in a bag. Uh, so I do, I do, but a lot of times the bag is just for the the grain and the colonization. Then I end up dumping it in a tub when it's time to actually grow it. So. Mm. Although some. Things, some varieties do seem to really thrive in bags. Like I've seen people get some like monster, monster Jack Frosts in bags. Yeah, I had a really good Jack Frost flush in a bag. I've only grown it in a bag, actually. The bags are decent. They got their flaws, of course, like anything else, but they're they're pretty decent in my opinion. I was surprised to hear that you don't really do those that you do tubs with how much you're doing. But I get it with the footprint. But yeah, it might it just might depend on my mood at the time when the, <laughs> when, the, when, the when the when the bags are ready. If I've got an empty tub, it might be calling my name. Mm -hmm. But that's that's always been like uh, something that I've strived for is 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 finding that that balance in the rotation where I have enough enough jars and enough plates and enough tubs that they all kind of work in unison and i don't ever need to buy more of any one part of the process like I, I try to get that balance going to where when the when the grain's ready it goes in the tub and when the tub's ready something goes in it and then when the agar's ready it goes into a jar and everything kind of works in in uh in rotation otherwise otherwise your your hobby can grow out of control like you can just constantly, <laughs> just constantly keep buying more jars and more tubs. Well, and that's and that's something else that that like I, I get asked about a lot is that like I I grow a lot of different stuff at once, but my grow area is actually really small. It's a very small closet. Uh, it's not even a walk-in closet. It's just a small bedroom closet with a couple of shelving units in it, and a whole shit ton of tiny tubs. You doing dub tubs? You said no, they're they're mini mono tubs. They're, so they're they're easier to stack that way than the dub tubs. 
Uh, yeah. But they're they're like six point two, maybe six point five quart, and they're and they're a little bit taller than your traditional six quart shoebox, but not quite as long. So they they've got more room for like a substrate level and then fruits in the same tub. They are not probably ideal as far as like overall yield goes. They're they're set up for fast fruiting. So like their their first flush is usually banging. And then by the time they get to the second flush, they've lost a lot of moisture and it's hard to get them to rehydrate properly because they do have a lot of airflow. But uh, but like I said, they're they're set up for speed more than anything else. Yeah, I definitely noticed whenever I was running bag experiments how the small four T bags would fruit a lot faster. So whenever I was trying to just kind of fruit something really fast, like you're saying, I would do it in a smaller one as well. I definitely noticed the smaller cakes do their thing a lot quicker. Well, and it's it's I I don't need like fifty five gallon tubs of fruits. Like I'd go nuts if I had that many mushrooms. So, like, I mean, even with these little tubs, like, they can do a few flushes, but I usually toss them after the first just so I can put something new in them. And I still end up with way more mushrooms than I need. <laughs> but the squirrels like them. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> Feel like I'm hogging all your time, man. I don't know. I feel rude. To keep asking questions. <laughs> I wish somebody else would ask one. <laughs> I I have a question. Go for it. Um, just uh, kind of comparing the uh, the evolution of of all of the cultivation stuff to cannabis, and seeing how a lot of it went from you know home cultivations and garage grows and stuff to to you know now these million dollar operations. Um, I, I'm out of Las Vegas, so you know you see firsthand a lot of these huge corporations kind of exploding now with cannabis. Uh, how would how do you think they're going to try and scale cultivation uh, in a way that you're not just moving out into a warehouse full of a thousand tubs? Well, I don't know. Like, I, I'm I'm really curious to see how things develop in in Oregon, where they've probably got the most advanced. Like, as far as legaliz legalization goes, they're further ahead there than anywhere else. Uh, and I know there's people like working to set up professional growing operations, and 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 uh, I just I don't I don't know how they're gonna do it. Like, like if you look at like commercial mushroom growing for for like regular edible mushrooms uh those warehouses full of like just like racks and racks of trays of solid like mushroom grows like it's just it's mind-blowing like how much mushrooms there is uh but i don't you know what are they going to do with all of them are they going to be like overpriced like the like the dispensary cannabis is like you know, i feel like the people that that go to the dispensaries here uh there was a long line out the door when they first opened because it was a novelty. Everybody wanted to go, but like for the most part, people are still buying their cannabis on the street because the, the shops are just overpriced. And, uh, and so it's good. Like if you want a specific variety with a name or a particular flavor, it's good because they've got it, but, but it's just not affordable. And so like the people that are using the dispensaries are the people that didn't have any connections to buy it on the street and and wouldn't smoke it if it was illegal. Uh, so now that it's legalized, then they can go get their fancy stuff at the dispensary and and, and be a pothead. But I just I, yeah, I feel like mushrooms are going to be kind of the same way. Like there's going to be a big boom uh, when it first becomes available. But uh, they're so cheap to grow. Like they're just so phenomenally cheap to grow. Like anybody that knows how to grow them is going to grow them instead of buying them. I mean, it's just it's it's silly. It is pretty crazy how easily they grow once you once you get it down. It's it's you got to get over that hump. I mean, it's challenging at first, but then when you once it clicks, then it's like oh, <laughs> and then you get that rotation going, and it's just like like I, I I probably pick like like four or five tubs of different things a day uh, out of my rotation of tiny tubs. So it's it's always something coming up. 
Well, thank you. I would I would love to go work one of those giant warehouse grow things. Like <laughs> I think that would be that would be fantastic. Well, I've seen uh, this. There's a guy named uh, I, I believe it's Mossy Creek Mushrooms. He's been doing this stuff with aerating his LC, which I thought was really interesting, and it's it's making for almost like this mycelium jelly. And uh, I, I don't know that I've seen anyone trying that yet with a uh, you know Cabenzi LC. So I'm hoping. Well, I, I see think I was. That, uh, uh, I feel like I saw Alan Rockefeller had a post with like some like weird like mycelium balls. They were like little spiky balls of like mycelial clusters, like. Mm -hmm. That's I well, that's weird stuff. But it looked cool. I don't know what you'd do with it, but it looks it looks cool. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think like I think there'll probably be like a lot more convenient ways to grow once it's legalized. Like like you'll be able to go to your your shop and just get like LC and all in one bag type things. And it'll be easy to like just kind of pop it in there and do it yourself. I worry that a lot of the nuance is going to get lost, kind of like it did with cannabis, you know, like a, the, the kind of a, a names will get lost in the shuffle, you know, like some brand will buy up the name and just rename it whatever they want. Oh, I don't, I don't really recognize any of the names that they've got at the dispensary now. It's all like everything is like a mix of like three different names. Like you can't get like White Widow anymore. It's like, it's like, white wedding cake kush whoosh skittles like like what is it like <laughs> just like everything's just got like everything's just bizarre now like I, I i would like to see like some of the old like cannabis strains like 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 just like every now and then you run across like some like regular like durban poison or something like that like that's cool like i like that but everything is like sour sour alien kush vomit or whatever That's that's kind of why I was asking how how you felt about naming things um, and tracing the lineage because they are so much more uh, they, they they probably got so much faster than cannabis or anything else I can think of you know and they mutate into totally different organisms within just a couple generations sometimes. Well, that's what that's why I feel like a lot of the commercial stuff is probably going to be like mostly like your standard varieties like more than it is like the, the special ones uh just mainly because they're the easiest to grow and and mass produce like they're going to be looking to to produce like volume and so like things that are slower growing like like a like a ghost or something like that it's very potent but the yield on it isn't particularly great so like for these like commercial companies that are just looking to make sales like they're probably going to be aiming more for like the the standard run of the mill varieties. But they'll still probably name them all kinds of goofy shit just to, just to make a sale. So, and you get some of that anyway. Like we've always had like things like, uh, like purple mystics and, and, you know, whatever, like uh, blue meanie cubes, like that are just, they're just, they're cubes, but they're named blue meanies because like, actual blue meanies sound good but the blue meanie cubes are just regular cubes with a blue meanie name so it's like you could have just like I'd, I'd rather know with like the the regular cubes i'd rather know where it was from like a location name like so so that like keeps the genetics more like distinct like if it's from cambodia call it cambodian like like uh keepers creepers is like a, a cambodian isolation uh, which is, it grows a little bit thicker, uh, but it's still Cambodian. Like, it's not that special to really deserve a name, I don't think. What's your opinions about mislabeled genetics? Once it's mislabeled, does it lose value to you? You said you had a, uh, one that you forgot to put a label on, and that's actually exciting you more than all the others. <laughs> It is, but like it's not like if it comes up and it's immediately recognizable. Like if it comes up and it's it's Jack Frost or El Chaco or something that I can recognize right away, uh, then then I'll go ahead and put a label back on it. But uh, <laughs> if if I honestly don't know what it is, I usually toss it. 
Uh, I'll grow it just to look at it, and if I still can't figure out what it is, then I don't, it doesn't get swabbed or anything. Uh, there's a couple exceptions to that. Uh, my my Crooked Mystery uh, variety. Uh, somebody sent me a swab. People send me a lot of swabs. Like People swab their mutants and send it to me to play with. Uh, but somebody had sent me a swab in an unlabeled package. like There was nothing written on it, and the actual envelope itself didn't have a return address or anything. So, and, and it ended up sitting on my shelf for a year before I got around to opening it. So by the time I opened it, I had no idea what it was or who sent it to me. Uh, and it grew these like enormous, crooked, lumpy, monstrous fruits like that were like so distinctly unique. Like I couldn't just throw them away uh, because they were just too interesting. Uh, and so I ended up calling it Crooked Mystery. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's a cool genetic. I wish I knew where it came from. And what it was when I first when I first grew it out, I posted it in every mushroom group that I was in, asking if you know the original sender would recognize it and and come forward and identify it. And I never got a response. Uh, I got a bunch of people guessing like different things that it could be, but nobody knew. <laughs> but I mean, like you know, if if it's if it's a if it. If it doesn't have a history and it's still really cool, then that's when its history starts. I, I guess right. you know, like that's the beginning of its history. And they all come from somewhere. <laughs> like the original, uh, the original PE was what Amazonian. Like, and I, I've grown some Amazon that were definitely very, very normal, but I, you know. Whoever, whoever, like uh, Rich G or whoever that originally stumbled across it and isolated it, like he did a good job. Uh, there was a Hamilton Morris interview he did recently with uh, some some old uh, Spanish guy who who says he he was like the creator uh, of PE, and he kind of talked about stuff that I've kind of just seen you and Jick doing from the beginning and that's just that he just picked out weird ones he ended up cultivating from dried material so he grew it on like a dish or something and then uh, it grew a flush but he just made sure to clone the really weird mutant ones one that he said grew kind of upside down it couldn't hold its head up and then like the other one just looked weird and that those he had two different kinds and they would just kind of cycle back and forth in the two different kinds to keep PE alive. And that was actually was... that was actually one of the first varieties that I that I started growing when I first grew. Uh I had B plus, Cambodian, and uh and then PE. And uh and I lost the PE after a couple of generations because I didn't really understand uh that it didn't drop spore prints. Like I knew how to take a spore print. I didn't know about swabs then. Uh, I just I knew about spore prints and I knew about syringes, and uh, and the syringes came from spore prints as far as I knew. So so I had these PE and uh, and they grew like these amazing mushrooms. But I kept putting the caps on the foil and it wouldn't drop anything off. And I was getting pissed off. And then I ended up getting contamination and losing them. And uh, and I didn't actually get back around to that variety again until. Just in the last year, I, I went ahead and, and got them again and uh, started growing them again. And within two generations, I found an albino and isolated it. And I'm working on stabilizing that. But it's like it's like a like a pure it's like ape, but not a cross. Like it's just like a pure PE albino. And uh, I'm really excited for those. So whenever you get something like an ape that doesn't drop your spores, to run it those five times, how are you? Are you still just swabbing it and running the swabs, or like, is that why it, it got lost? I'm, I'm just, I, I don't know. I'm, it's always the question, right? Is uh, whenever you're swabbing something that doesn't have, drop spores or has clear spores, are you? taking a clone tissue with a swab instead of actually getting spores with that swab, you know? 
Well, I always check. I always check under the microscope for swab for, for spores. So like I usually know mm. if there's going to be spores or not. And if I don't see spores, like if I take like a number of gill samples from a fruit and don't find any spores on it, then I usually just clone it and, and skip the swab. Uh, but I do know you can you can get growth from a swab that has gill fragments on it. You can essentially get a clone from a swab as well. Uh, so it is possible to to swab a sporeless fruit and still get some growth for it, but it's it's not it's not a hundred percent guaranteed that it'll that it'll survive. But uh, but like uh, like Mr. Crinkle is a uh, is a tat tat mutant that uh, that came up pretty early in my in my tat adventures, uh, but it was like a hard little mushroom shaped lumpy rock hard little thing like. It looked like a mushroom, but it didn't have any kind of gills or anything. The cap was just a solid lump on top of the stem, and uh, and I cloned it, and then the next the next generation that grew from that clone produced large fruits with actual caps and gills. So now, just now, I've I, I lost Mr. Crinkle. I gave away all my swabs, and uh, and I thought it was lost forever, but I eventually found one, and just recently got it started again. And I had this fruit growing kind of like the original Mr. Crinkle fruit that it started from, where it just had a stem with a lump at the top and and no gills of any kind. So I was like, well, here we are again, back to this. And it only grows like one or two fruits in a tub. Like it's it's really a shitty producer. It's just, it's so weird that it, it has value in its weirdness. And uh, and and they grow just like super slow and, and, and wooden hard. Like they're they're really weird. But so I've got this lumpy fruit, this like lump on a stick, basically, with no 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 actual gills. And then after a week of looking like that, it just like shat gills out from underneath the lump. Like it just spread out like wings, like it just opened up gills out of nowhere. Uh, so now it's actually got a cap underneath the lump and like kind of a lumpy crown for the cap. So I'm excited for, for that one to actually possibly make spores. But just because it has gills doesn't mean it has spores. Like it's it's a finicky one. But like Mr. Crinkle, Mr. Crinkle isn't isn't a good grow. It's not like it's not like it'll ever produce like a whole lot for you. Like it's it's super frustrating. But where its value comes in is is in the crosses, the 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 chocolate crinkle cross that I did with it, where it's a uh, Mr. Crinkle and El Chaco cross together, is like a like a greatest hits mutation compilation. Like it does the weirdest shit you ever saw. Like. Anything from enigma type brains to bizarre misshapen fruits with cap parts sticking out of their asses, like it's it, it just it's you never know what it's gonna do, and uh, and it's probably probably the strongest thing I've got. Hmm. But but it's funny, like you said, the the weirdness usually follows, or rather the the potency rather follows the weirdness. It seems to be a trend. There's there's a there's a strong correlation between growth speed and strength. Like, the slower growing the fruits are, the stronger they are stronger. generally. Absolutely. Uh, but like, but there's also like density as a factor too. Like like fruits that grow really solid seem to pack in a lot of heat. And uh, and then like your your faster growing cubes, like they just don't have enough time to develop those alkaloids. So they you know they they, they pop up and they're ready in like you know two days three days from the time they pin. Uh, but the chocolate crinkle fruits, I've had fruits grow for over a month where they're still, like, I ended up picking them, but they were still growing because I just was like, the, the tub was starting to contaminate and the fruit was still going. But it's a it's a, it's a a beast. I think uh, uh, Jordan Jacobs just tested some of the, the chocolate crinkle brains and they came out to like, I think it was like 2.2% uh, psilocybin. Which is like I think average, like your average cubensis is like, I like like point seven, or something like that, point seven to point one percent. I guess I'm using those swabs tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the chocolate crinkle is a neat one too because because it actually gives you, like. Enigma type growths from spore, whereas like usually you know with Enigma it's 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 culture trade only, 
uh, which is kind of limiting. But but having a chance of getting those brains from just from a regular spore swab is kind of neat. And it's not 100%. Sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. Uh, but it's 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 life is like a box of chocolates. If, uh, I actually just you said, guys... uh, I, got, I got two pairs of your uh, albino prick. I sent a pair to uh, our resident oral expert. Uh, goes to buy magic or dude just kills it all the time. But uh, his enigma grows or something else. So I sent it to him. I said, do your magic. Man. Pretty excited to see what he does. Yeah, fingers crossed. Like, I... I feel like a lot of people's grows look better than mine. Like, like with my genetics, like when I, like I'll, I'll have something that I feel like I've been working it and it's ready for release. And I've got these shitty little multi-spore tubs that just don't give you a canopy. And then, and then I'll send these spores out to the world and then people post up their grow with it. And they've got like this packed wall to wall canopy of it. And I'm like, they probably fucking did some transfers or something before they sent it to green. But, uh, <laughs> But that, I mean, it just makes me feel good. Like I, I, if if it's performing well enough for me for multispore, then I, I feel pretty confident that it'll do it'll do well for somebody that actually like puts the work into trying to trying to perfect their tub technique. Because my tubs are not not meant for perfection; they're meant for speed, and and I accept some some loss as far as overall yield goes. But uh, it does it does make me feel good when I see people post up their fucking. Uh, they're like Jack Frost grows, and it's like wall to wall caps, like solid, like that looks nice. I was just saying that the other day. It's it's a very satisfying feeling. It's it's <laughs> like you said. It's kind of a little funny whenever they get a better grow than you did out of it, but it's satisfying to know that you helped steward that grow. You know, that mycelium yeah. went through. And that's how it happened, you know. It's it's it, they're they're like babies, you know. It's like you like you see your 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 kid walk across the graduation stage or whatever. You're like, ah, I fucking did a good job with that one. Absolutely. But if anybody ever wants any, I've got some shitty spores too. Uh, I do. Uh, I do have a stash of like problem problem genetics that don't perform well. That uh, if anybody's ever looking for a challenge, <laughs> uh, one that I've one that I've I'm finally making some headway with, I think, is I've got this uh, golden halo and uh, and and Lang cross. It was golden halo and Lang, which is a Lang is a, a tat isolation. It's like a like a thicker, denser golden teacher, uh, and the combination with the golden halo produced like a like a very small very dainty squat mushroom uh like little buttons and they're they're tiny and they're beautiful and prone to contamination like i've been working this thing for like three years and i've probably had like maybe like a handful of successful fruits from it but i keep fighting with it and I, i've got a tub now that that finally has like a good number of fruits in it and it hasn't turned green yet so i don't know if it turned a corner i don't know if this culture just had like mushroom aids or what its problem was but it can't defend itself from contamination for shit but uh but finally it's starting to actually produce some decent looking fruit so i'm like fingers crossed maybe it's actually gonna survive and then make it out to make it out to the market uh but i've always been a sucker for the squatty mushrooms like the the kss squats have been my all-time favorite to eat forever like they're they're shaped like little pumpkins or whatever like they look funny so they're cool to grow in that regard because they just look so different but they also just pack a hell of a punch like they're they're like a giant mushroom squashed into a smaller shape That's been my experience with ghosts. I think it's gonna, it's my favorite, hands down. Uh, they're tiny little freaking firecrackers, man. 
that's that's like the 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 tat black caps too which came from ghost they they started as a ghost mutation but they're like they're just ridiculous strong and uh and uncooperative like tim pig has had has had the best the best success of any cultivator with the tat black cap line as far as getting them to produce spores uh because a lot of times like i'll get like a tub full of fruits and can't find a single spore on any of them which i was i was leaning towards like this is going to end up being like the next enigma because it's going to just be a culture trade because i can't get it to fucking produce spores but uh but tim pig's got some fantastic black caps like his his are he he nailed that one I just got Nebula from Tim Pig. I'm really that should be amazing. I've had a lot of weird stuff happen with Starry Night. I don't know why. I don't know if it's just my luck or, or just a. Uh, I don't know. I think that's just a just a general ape thing. Like ape is like probably one of the most frustrating genetic lines that i've worked with like it, when it produces well it produces well and when it doesn't it, it gives you jack shit like and 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 then like i had i had this really great ape culture going for a while that i'd used for the jack Fro frost cross and then after like i was obsessed with jack frost and then the case at cross for a while so i i ended up like stopping growing them and and losing the live culture and then uh when I tried to restart them from spores again, they, they turned like golden capped and that turned into my brass monkey isolation after a few generations. But, uh, I'm still trying to get my, my original apes going again and they are definitely not cooperative. And I think that's part of the problem with the starry nights too, is it's just, it's just that ape lineage is just difficult. Like once you get it, it'll be great, but it's, it's fucking getting that right combination of spores. Yeah, I've never really done any kind of of the brains or Nagma or anything, and it just seemed like I had a whole bunch of tubs growing these weird, like, clams and, and just weird growths, and I'm trying to, like, choke them out to make them grow more, and I'm just going to keep cloning them and putting them to grain and keep doing it. But uh, it, it's it's weird. Uh, from a hobby perspective, it's, it's really cool and, and fun, but it's just uh, it's a lot of work, and it's just weird weird when stuff like that pops up it makes it very fun those brains are strong though they're <laughs> they're they're definitely they're definitely strong like my my first enigma trip i had uh i had actually eaten eight and a half grams of apes on a friday night and uh and then my enigma tub was ready to harvest like, like the next day and i was really eager to try it because i you know i just started growing it and i was like so I'm just going to eat like seven grams of it. And I figured with my tolerance from the day before, uh, that should be enough for me to just kind of feel it so I could kind of gauge the potency. And it fucking sent me to outer space. Like I was fucked. Like I literally like went to outer space and witnessed the formation of our solar system from an external standpoint, like watching the gases swirl together into balls and everything. That was, it was mind blowing. And then, and then back and forth into reality. Like I'd be back, back here in like perfect crisp reality, bopping around the house, functioning. And the next thing you know, I'm laying on the carpet again, like just kind of licking, licking the floor. Uh, but yeah, it it definitely kicked my ass. And I've heard a couple of people say that they they didn't think their enigma was very strong, but I don't know if they just picked it very early or what, because it was definitely it was definitely strong when I ate it. Seems like folks are getting tired, boss. Well, it's ten o'clock. We've been on for three hours, so <laughs> yeah, you, you're the man, dude. It's time to Real. time to call it a night. I got to go feed my animals. For anybody that doesn't know, I, I grow more than mushrooms. I also uh, grow guinea pigs and hedgehogs. And, wow. Uh, 
Thanks for all your time today and <laughs> taking time away from your animals to, to answer questions and just chat. Yeah. It's been really cool. Yeah, I appreciate you. it for one. And it's 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 time to it's time to the, the hedgehogs are nocturnal, so it's time to take care of them. They're getting up right about now. But yeah, it's been good. Uh, I'll, I'll be popping back in tomorrow. Like I said, I'll be back in here uh, checking my Discord messages tomorrow and uh, taking care of any requests that we have in there. And uh, I'll see you guys on the flip side.